You folks have the floor? Yeah. One way or the other. I apologize for being late. Move it along. Just name and title, and you guys got the floor. Welcome. Uh, Jean Hoy, Director of the Family Services. Thank you for having Welcome. us. Uh, Joan Lawson, Chair of Enfield Together Coalition. Bonnie Smith. Bonnie Smith, I'm the Contracted Evaluation Consultant for the grant for. Welcome, guys. Go ahead. So, um, Way in the back. You have the. As the, the chair of Enfield Together Coalition, I'll just kind of start off. So our, uh, I'd like to start off with our vision that the Enfield Together Coalition envisions a community moving uh, forward drug-free, finishing strong. And our mission is uh, dedicated to reducing and preventing underage drinking and substance use in Enfield through raising awareness, education of parents and youth, and enforcing underage drinking laws. So our target audience is um, parents in youth ages 8 to 18. And one of the ways we do this is using um, SAMHSA's um, strategic prevention framework. And again, we're data driven. And so I, I know there isn't a slide up there for that. But we uh, assess and um, we build uh, capacity um, through building awareness in our community. We prioritize uh, risk factors and identify evidence-based uh, strategies. And uh, we increase the community awareness and um, through social, um, feed social marketing. And then we measure the success um, and the outcomes that we get. So that's just a little bit. And we also, um, uh, there's a slide up there for the seven, the other way we do this is the seven strategies for community change. So provide, and you see some pictures up there, providing um, information. We have our digital ads and do things such as billboards, which I'm sure many of you have seen around town. We have um, blitz days to get our information out. Uh, we enhance skills. Uh, some of the things that we um, have used is hidden in plain sight, which um, is done by uh, Kelly Fisher. Uh, she has uh, a little trailer that um, has information in it for parents to see how kids can get hold of these substances that are dangerous. Um, we also uh, uh, have our uh, Dropbox, which is our 24-7, uh, our enforcement has, um, there are partners and they uh, have that at the police uh, station. So we really emphasize through much of our um, advertising to use that Dropbox so that uh, we would get drugs out of the hands of our youth and uh, people who that would um, hurt. Um, also, uh, part of this is providing support. So there are some things that happen. There's Thursday and Wednesday night school, the middle school uh, summer therapeutic uh, programs, the expert screening, which is really important, and uh, treatment and recovery brochures. Um, and then just our, uh, we enhance uh, access to reduce barriers, um, doing compliance checks, and uh, host usually two uh, take back days a year. And then um, change consequences. We host tips training to non-compliant -com um, establishment serving alcohol and provide incentive to those using the drop box. And then change and modify policy. Uh, youth that are caught with marijuana are refer referred to the Juvenile Review Board. And Fragile Handle with Care is another initiative. And I know Jean has um, some information and Bonnie that they're going to share about our, um, our uh, sur uh, a school survey that um, was taken two years ago. So you saw some pictures and some things that were happening. Okay, so we have a slide here that just provides an overview of some areas that youth um, can be at risk of establishing a substance use problem. I won't read it for you, but these are things that we like to consider when we look at our data and we look at our community. And just as some background, um, this is the 2017 student survey outcomes for grades 6 through 12. This was the first year that the high schools were combined in the survey set. So we've been surveying the community technically since 2005 with a little bit of a break and then again in 2009 it became more consistent every 24 months with grant funding. So I'm going to quickly move forward through some of our outcomes because I can tell you have a busy agenda and I've done this before. <laughs> 
So here is our past 30 day use of our most common substances and the behavior of gambling. Gambling is a risk factor for other substance use issues or addiction issues and many youth oftentimes start risky behaviors with gambling and within our long survey there is a definition of what that is often asked of me. So you can see here um, at the high school where the most substance use occurs in the past 30 day use, not within the school, but within that population, of course, you see marijuana is the number one substance used, followed by alcohol, then e-cigarettes, um, binge drinking, which is four or more drinks on one occasion, and gambling comes in there as well. Many communities, of course, ask me about prescription drugs and heroin, and I'm happy to tell you that at this age group, we don't see that as common at the high school age. It tends to be something that youth may progress to if they're going to as young adults. We ask about sources of alcohol. This is percent, sometimes, or often. Middle school students are most likely to get their alcohol at home with per parents' permission. And this is only asked of youth who said they had used alcohol in the past 30 days. So this is a subset of the full um, youth who reported alcohol use, where high school students most commonly will report it from friends, followed by at home with parents' permission or without parents' permission, as well as other people who buy it for you. We can't really tell you much about that without a focus group, of course. So we look at these risk factors. So perception of harm is a risk factor. You want to see this high. High perception of harm means typically lower use rates. So at the middle school level, the lowest perceived harm is gambling, followed by marijuana. At the high school level, that moves a little bit. We see marijuana is perceived as the least harmful of what you see in front of you, followed by gambling. And the highest perception of harm is heroin. Perce parental perception of approval or disapproval is another thing we look at. We want to see that high. And not surprising to me, and maybe not surprising to you, the middle school is fairly consistent across substances and gambling. Whereas at the high school, it starts to dip down a little bit by substance. Following that same trend that we just saw about harm, marijuana is perceived the most acceptable by parents. So you think their parents would be maybe the most comfortable with marijuana, followed by gambling pretty closely heroin remains high. And then peer approval or disapproval, same thing. We want to see that high. These are things that protect our youth from potentially using substances or misusing. The middle school, that perception of disapproval remains pretty high across substances and gambling, with gambling being slightly lower than the others. At the high school level, same thing, marijuana, gambling the two lowest, heroin being the highest, and um, tobacco, kind of hanging out closely to alcohol. We always, of course, want to look at our trend data. And you can see there's been significant progress in youth substance use rates in the community since 2009, with alcohol following a nice step down pattern, ending at 20.4% of high school students reporting alcohol use in the past 30 days in 2017. Binge drinking has gone down as well, kind of leveling out over the last two surveys. DUI went down and dipped right back up. That's drinking or driving under the influence of alcohol. Um, we don't know why. You know, sometimes there's things in data that are just we can't answer without further probing from youth. Cigarettes have gone down as well. We didn't begin looking at e-cigarettes until 2013, and it was quite pro progressive in 2013 to even look at that at that time. So e-cigarettes, according to our survey, have gone down since 2013. However, I'm guessing if we surveyed again today, the use rates would be higher than what we see here at 13.1%. Um, marijuana is holding fairly steady, as well as prescription drugs. Um, so we're hoping in our current environment we can keep that marijuana steady, if not bring it down. Looking at e-cigarettes, because this is a hot topic among communities, for good reason. I wanted to show you the direct comparison of cigarettes versus e-cigarettes past 30-day use. So you can see that e-cigarettes are used by high school students almost th three times as much as traditional cigarette products, tobacco products, in the past 30 days. And we asked youth what they put in the cigarettes when they do use them, the e-cigarettes. And the number one thing is e-flavored liquids. And this was select all that apply, so this won't add up to 100, followed by marijuana or cannabis products, then tobacco and nicotine products. Alcohol came in at almost 17%, and then other. So just understanding that and how it is connected to other substance use issues. 
These are our mental health indicators. So I've felt so sad or hopeless that it stopped me from doing my usual activities is the depression indicator. The blue is middle school, 2015 and 2017, and the green is high school. So you can see that there's been a slight increase between 2015 and 2017 at both the middle and high school level. And this is consistent at that 14.7% for high school with what I see in other communities. It's usually ranging from 12 to 16%. And then we ask a suicide question here about um, consideration of suicide in the past year. Similar patterns. So more significant increases here than we saw for the depression indicator between the two surveys, uh, with the most significant increase occurring in the middle school between 2015 and 2017. And this is, again, very similar with what I see in every community. But what I said to the Board of Ed last week is, this is serious. Like, it doesn't matter if it's 1%. It's something we want to take very seriously in our community when we think about prevention initiatives. So with that, Jean, I'm sure you want to add to that and talk about youth services. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about what programs we have done through the Suicide Prevention Steering Committee to help support the work of substance use prevention because mental health promotion, addressing trauma, does really show healthier outcomes for youth. So. Several years ago, you funded two clinical social workers, and since then, we've been very instrumental in going in and screening our, our youth through our expulsion programs, suspension programs, um, our after-school programs. So again, we're prevention, so we're before someone gets diagnosed with, with a disorder of substance addiction. We want to catch those kids when they're starting to use because their, their outcomes for treatment is so much greater than someone who becomes diagnosed with addiction, we know that's so hard to treat once those chronic disease models come in. So we're very passionate about making sure we catch our kids when they're first starting to use. So there's this federally endorsed screening process, process called ESPERT. So it's asking kids um, sort of what substance are you using, when did you start using it, how much are you using now, so we can kind of do a screen and assess kind of their current use so we know where to refer them for services. It's like, good job, you're doing you're doing a great job, you're making good choices, to you're starting to show some signs of early substance use, so let's talk about making healthier decisions. Why are you using? Um, and we wanna monitor those kids over time, because we know kids who have a history of mental health disorders, depression, suicidal ideation, sort of uh, push out policies around discipline. We know they're getting more disconnected from us. We want them in schools. We wanna, we're more concerned about sort of timing them in keeping them close to us, finding out more about why do you feel the need to use substances in school? Why do you feel, what is substance use replacing in your life so that we can really turn those trajectories around and keep them close to us? Because once we push them out into our system, we lose track of them and they stay out of school, they start losing grades, they start failing. Um, we just lose them and I don't want to see that starting to happen. So we provide a lot of counseling and case management so we can just track those kids over time and connect them to different educational programs, to different treatment resources in our community. And just with any sort of chronic disease, we know that depression can reoccur, suicidality can reoccur. So like you know when you go to your doctor, every year you get screened for blood pressure, you get screened your temperature. We know that kids need to get re-screened because things happen, life happens. So a kid who's been vulnerable to depression or suicidality may in a year from now come come back with those same kind of feelings. Treatment is short term, so kids often get discharged from treatment very quickly, so the dosage of support and treatment is not enough. So again, by rescreening these kids, we can really reconnect with them and get them back into programs and services that support them. Um, as you can see, our substance abuse um, initiative is all funded through our federal grant, and it's because we're, be, we're able to do data-driven mm -hmm. initiatives. We can show um, through our evaluation reports and our data that what we're doing is producing good outcomes and it's make, made, made us very eligible for federal and state funding, which is really supporting all this work. One of the things I love about drug-free communities is it really believes in developing the, the capacity of your community to, to address mm -hmm. this issue. And one of that is really spending time to understand what are root causes, what are causal factors and what are evidence-based strategies to do this as a community. So I really love that we've engaged our community sectors to really um, bring back a perspective and understanding of knowledge that we're working together and not against each other as we push this work out. Um, 
And then the Suicide Prevention Steering Committee um, is really invested in broadening the scope of our work so that we're bringing all prevention initiatives under one big advisory council because right now it's we have all these initiatives going on and it's not connected. So that's our wish that we start bringing all this work together, bring all these funding streams together so that we can be more wise in how we spend and how we train and how we address our issues. I am concerned about the uptick in depression and suicidality. It's, an, it's also a national trend, even though the substance use is going down, depression and anxiety is going up. Um, there's some initial research out there that the sort of the use of technology is really sort of disconnecting our kids from those personal connections and relationships um, that are really important. And we know through research that one of the best protective factors is strong connection to another adult. So I'm just really curious to, to understand why even though we're sort of addressing one issue, the other issues are really on the rise, which also our kids are saying they're using marijuana and substances to manage anxiety. So even though sort of the cause and root causes and reasons why kids may use is changing. And I just think we need to be aware of where we need to be and uh, create strategies that really address that. So thank you for letting us come and present our work to you. Thank you. Councillor Sferraza. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm very familiar, obviously, with the Enfield to Together Coalition and all my years in the police department. I always felt it was so important to educate our kids and use preventive measures before they started using and we had to get involved. But I just want to ask you something. I'm, I'm concerned your very first slide said that the number one reason um, or causal factor is easy access and availability of substance. Would you agree with that? Well, well you I, must because it's on your... Well, I think there's several risk factors. I think you, you can't say there's one reason why could, kids... Could you go back to that first slide, you think? You're talking about this Risk one? factors? Yes. Yeah. Oh. That one. So the very first one at the top of the pyramid or circle there says access and availability. They're not in any order. It's okay. just that well, these are all risk factors. It's a risk factor. It's a risk factor. So do you find it in any way problematic that we currently have a bill introduced in Hartford to legalize marijuana to make it more accessible to adults, but also in your presentation you said how um, parents view marijuana sometimes as less. So we're, we're doing everything we can and we know from studies that the earlier use of marijuana impacts worse outcomes brain development do you find it potentially problematic that the children now are going to see that if this bill passes that marijuana is legal just like alcohol and cigarettes do you, do you have any issue or comment on that or? I do worry through research that as parents perceive something as not harmful, kids' use goes up. There's a very wise woman sitting up there who once said what, what parents kind of condone easily, kids will do in excess. Right. So I think it sends a, a sort of a difficult message that it's, it's, it's not harmful, and that worries me because we know marijuana is very harmful right. to the developing brain. I just was you know, watching, I read an article today and they just introduced that bill and I know it's going to be discussed and I kind of find it a contradiction to what we're trying to teach our kids when we're sending a, a different message. But, okay, thank you yes, very much. good point. No, thank you. And I want to thank you and the police department for all your work. I, I know she didn't really go into all the compliance checks, all the party patrols, all the work that you have done as a police department with us. So thank you. Thank you. Councilor Hi, thank you for coming. I've attended so many of your meetings and I know how hard you work, so thank you. Um, could you briefly explain to us, is it the Handle with Care program that you offer? Um, there may be some people here that aren't aware of it and some people at home that don't know about it. I think it's an important thing. So we're really committed to postvention for kids who've been exposed to trauma. So we found that there's a lot of incidents where there's a traumatic event that's happened in the home. So we know through our overdose um, age range of adults who are overdosing either by attempt or by death, they're in their middle 30s or 40s. They have children in the home. So we started to get really worried about our children who may be exposed to seeing a parent um, almost die in their presence. We also learned some very big stats from our police department around domestic violence and the number of children that may see this. So um, these kids often would come into school the next day not having their homework done, not having breakfast, being very anxious, being very afraid. Maybe mom spent the entire evening 
in the hospital because mom was injured. So instead of seeing these kids as n being sort of, I guess, disrespectful and, and not engaged in their school, we want to see them. These are kids who are really struggling, and they need they need a break today, and we need to check with them to make sure they're okay. So our police department did this Fragile with Care initiative. So if the police responded to a home where there was a traumatic event that kids may be exposed to, they simply do a little referral form that says, without any identifying information, this child may, may needs a little handle with care today, and the schools follow up with the child. We don't ask questions, just like, just checking in with you, want to make sure you're okay, I'm here for you. So our police department has done that with us. That's great. Thank you. Council Crisati. Uh, yeah, same with myself. I attend quite a few of the Enfield Together Coalition meetings, and uh, your, your committee does a fantastic job with, with all of your programs that, you, that you're doing. I like that your program, when you actually do your blitzes, <laughs> all right, I think, I think that's uh, great for our community. You hit on two important issues, anxiety and depression. Um, I'm glad that uh, you know those are going to be two focal points for your group because I think that's really really important we see that more and more often uh, with our young kids to right now you talk about suicide prevention anxiety depression that you know, they follow with each other so thank you for uh, you know your hard work and I'll be keep attending yeah. thank okay. you yeah. so, so yeah, I got this from what you guys sent in, and I have to admit I'm a little, I guess, disappointed, for lack of a better word. 85% of kids don't think their parents would be upset if they're using marijuana. Or, excuse me, only 85% think their kids, I mean, this should be 100% across the board. So my, my question is, how do we improve this number? So I appreciate the, you know, the stats, and stats are going in the right direction. But the marijuana does scare me, to be honest, especially to what Councilor uh for as I said, we're thinking about legalizing it. It messes with kids' minds. There's no other way around it. And if you've been around kids, you've seen them. It's that's the reality of it. So, so the question: When we define you, this council that you're going to put together, or this committee, sorry, for lack of a better word, how do we define good mental health? So, I, you know, we talk about mental health. What is a good definition? Of, so, is it someone who's mentally strong who understands it? Again, do we teach kids how to overcome adversity? Do we teach kids that, you know, I understand some of the trauma that they are, but maybe some of the other kids who can help those kids? Yeah, I mean, what do we need to do a better job when it comes to developing mental strength in our kids to help the kids who really need it to what you're, you know, some of these traumas that you're describing, which, again, we hope no kid has to go through, but we understand it's reality. So, like, how do you define that and, you know, and, and then improve where this should be 100 across the board, in my opinion? I mean, so I throw it to you. I, I think good mental health, in a broad definition, is that kids have the resilience to cope with things that life throws at them. And we know that there's certain things that really impact children's resilience. Right. So I think the strategies are very broad across all the ages. I think what an older youth might need is different than a young one. I know with um, the suicide prevention grant, we're starting a little with Gizmo, a mental health sort of helping children identify feelings and identify a trusted adult so if they're going through something difficult that they know that they can go to somebody. I know the school is really invested in social emotional learning and mindfulness, um, doing those peace corners so that we really help children learn how to recognize and regulate their feelings. I think that's very, very important at a young age. Um, I think as kids get older, we know that mental health disorders are a reality. There's a, there's a genetic component to that. I think to me, it's like when we catch, we need to find those kids that are really starting to struggle early. Right. And I think every child has a different set of life factors um, and circumstances and genetics and life experiences that impact that. And I think it's got to be a whole kind of understanding what is going on with this child so that we can so make those coming, inroads. Do you need that from the it. parents or an adult? Like, again, what I mean defining mental health, I hate to say it, there is a bit of a, I hate to say it, a stigma to it, right? How do we define it where it's not a stigma, where, hey, listen, if someone's having some issues, especially a child, it's an adult's job to make sure they help that child. And so, so you get away, you know, instead of saying, well, you know, he's got, he or she's got issues, right? Well, you know what I mean? I think that's the question. 
Yeah, and I, I, w w I mean, I'm, I'm not putting you on the spot, but I think that's what I, I you know, because honestly, next year when you guys come back to us, I'm hoping to see that, that marijuana percentage go down. I have to admit, it scares me a little bit. I know. We've just started our marijuana campaign, if you've seen it, sort of, um, sort of have the joint conversation, have the pot talk. We just put right. table tents out all over town. We, yeah. It took us a, a bit to get that uh, message created with our community. Mm -hmm. We also need policy, right, right, around how we handle this from the legislation so mm -hmm. that we as a community send the message it's not good. Mm -hmm. And even the stigma, we need to stop that. I, I still have trouble getting permission to get some right. of the screenings done because right. they don't, it's family, it's privacy. No one needs to know this. Like, mental health should be the same as physical health. Exactly. Getting our pediatricians involved to screen and care. I think it takes a community to really get into this work and make it happen. I'm hoping with sort of getting the message out to parents that marijuana is very harmful to your child that will help start getting that perception of harm changed with parents. But again, with those seven strategies of community change, it takes all those levels of intervention to really make community level change. So if you have any ideas, I would love it. <laughs> you know, we don't put stigma on people who have medical problems. I really don't understand why we still Feel my my only idea is what exactly what you're doing is that you can't be afraid to talk about it. Thank you. You can't be afraid to talk about it. And I understand we none of us want to be perceived a certain way, right? We all want to be right. perceived as strong, we're healthy, we're happy, but we all aren't that way 365 days a year. I agree. So I, from what I would be, I mean, I'm willing to help whatever you feel because, again, I, I mean, we all have those internal struggles where we lose some of that confidence, right? But a lot of us, when we lose that confidence, don't, go to that extreme that we never want a kid to think they have to go to, right? right? I think that's, you know, again, I agree, I, I, you know, I'm certainly willing to help whoever you feel I could, but I think just, you know, I mean, it's funny, if you've ever volunteered for a kid's coaching or whatever it may be, and, and you go through those stages with kids, right? You know, the, the ones who just they're not get it naturally, you don't have to worry about those ones. It's amazing when you just get on a kid a little bit sometimes, you know, and then they realize, oh, maybe I do, I can do this. And then it, it's sort of their whole perception changes. And, and doing that, I think, is the hard part outside of an activity, right? You can do that if they're part of an activity. But how do you do it in the daily life, right? I think that's the trick. Yeah. If I could figure it out, I'd be a pretty rich guy. There you go. <laughs> Thank you for tomorrow night. Yeah. <laughs> Just one last comment. It's rhetorical, so I'm not putting you on the spot, but I wonder if this legislation passes and we have legalized marijuana and they come to you and the kids say, well, you're telling us it, it impacts brain development, it, 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 it's all these bad things, but why would the government legalize something that would hurt us? I, I don't know what the re I don't have an answer for that question. I, I hope, I'm glad I'm not, I don't have to answer that, but thank you. Unless you have an answer. <laughs> well, I don't know that I have an answer, but I think my, my response would be it's the same as alcohol legalization, right? We want responsible use. I don't, you know, as adults, you know, what you do as adults responsibly is one thing, but even alcohol use with young children and even young teens is not safe right. for them. Right. Thank you. And so just curious, how do you get this survey? So does this go to the parents? Like, for example, this, I mean, if I was a parent and I saw this game, I'd be, I'd be talking to my kid right away. So I guess the question is, how do we, how, how are we advertising this, for lack of a better word, if, if we are? So if, you know, I mean, stuff kids like this. Kids feel like, but shouldn't we let our parents know what the kids are thinking, you know, I mean. Like data dissemination. Right. How do we, exactly, that's exactly. Mm -hmm. So do we, I mean, is there a site on our website that this will be where if parents can go take a look? I mean. Well, I, I intend to put it on the town managers at least because that's the compendium of all of them. Right. And I'll just tell you as an aside, we've had a lot of people call up, even council people, to say people have asked about water pollution control or what about the right. plowing of the streets. And it's been a really good resource. So we're going to put that this there as well tomorrow. And that way, again, well, you can refer to see them. these survey results. Yeah. yeah. Again, appreciate your patience. We apologize. Sorry for Great running. job as always. And uh, we will see you. Uh, We'll see you soon back. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so Appreciate much. it. Thank you. This is actually what the students I know. Their parents but still. Yeah. So they're not getting the message. Yeah, exactly. Parents aren't just exactly right. the message today. Parents allow their kids to drink. I know. Did you see that? Yeah. The percentage of that? It's crazy. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a killer, isn't it? Oh, man. So we are... 
20 minutes behind, we are at the first public hearing. Um, again, we apologize for the delay. Um, this is March 18, 2019. Public hearing ground rules. This is for the uh, discussion on the TIF um, tax incentive fund. Public hearing has been scheduled to allow interested citizens an opportunity to express their opinions regarding the Midtown Enfield tax, tax incentive financing district and district master plan. Roll call, please. Councillor Sakala. Here. Councillor Crisotti. Here. Councillor Davis. Here. Councillor Denny. Here. Councillor Kiner. Here. Mayor Ludwig. Here. Councillor Muller. Here. Councillor Terraza. Here. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Here. Councillor Ungar. Here. There's 11 members present, none are absent. The following notice was a public hearing was published in the Hartford Current Friday, March 8, 2019. Town of Enfield legal notice. The Enfield Town Council will hold a public hearing on the Midtown Enfield Tax Incentive Financing District and District Master Plan, March 18, 2019, at 6.50 p.m. in the Council Chambers, Town Hall 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, to review and discuss the following. Authorizing crea creation of the Midtown Enfield Tax Incentive Financing District and adopting the Midtown Enfield Tax Incentive Financing District Master Plan for the District. At the public hearing, interested persons may be heard and written communications may be received. The Midtown Enfield Tax Incentive <coughs> Financing District Master Plan is available for public inspection during the normal business hours in the office of the town clerk, at, at the Enfield Public Library, and at the town's website. Ground rules for the public hearing. There is no time limit, but I ask each person not to take up too much time so everyone has the opportunity to speak. After each person who desires has had one chance to speak, I shall permit those, we shall permit those individuals who desire a second chance. After those individuals who desire to speak a second time, we shall permit those individuals who desire a third, fourth, etc. Please refrain from personalities and turn it over quickly. Yes, just briefly, it's a public hearing. It's not a Q&A, but we thought it would be appropriate to have our consultant, Patrick McMahon, give a 30-second little snapshot for those here and at home. And he did a very wonderful with Lori just uh, double-sided how TIF works and a diagram of the TIF district for downtown and the mall area. Patrick? So you got Thank you. 30 seconds, Patrick. Go ahead. All right. Yeah. Mayor and yeah. Town Council, 30 yeah. seconds. That's great. So uh, tax increment financing is an economic uh, development tool for reinvestment in specific areas of the community. Uh, it's not a new tax. You're essentially designating a portion of future tax revenue to be designated back into a community. Uh, I'm, uh, again, Patrick McMahon from the Connecticut, uh, Connecticut Main Street Center. We were hired to assist the community in adopting uh, the TIF. And essentially, we're making the recommendation that this Midtown TIF uh, be for a period of 20 years and that 50% of the future tax revenue that's generated from the district get reinvested in the district. And that's illustrated on this, uh, this page right here for members of the public. So for 20 years, whatever's currently being uh, produced in that district uh, will continue to go into the general funds. Okay? It's only the increase in assessment. And what we're proposing is that 50% of that would be designated to go to the district. The other 50% would go into the general fund. So here's a, a, an example. So if there's a thousand dollars today uh, that a property is putting off for in, in uh, tax revenue, and because of some improvements, all of a sudden it would be paying $1,500 in taxes, what will happen is the current thousand dollars in taxes will continue to go to the general fund. $250 of the increase will continue to go, will go into the general fund, and the other $250 would be separated and designated into a separate account. That separate account can be utilized for a number of different uh, it, uh, ways. It can be used for public infrastructure improvements, roadways, sidewalks, streetscaping, improvements to parks, improvements to community facilities. You utilize that funds to essentially improve the underlying uh, area so that it encourages additional development so that developers when they're looking will say I like this area this is worthy of investment and that's what the the purpose of this is for the mall area what we're proposing is essentially from the highway to basically Palumba Drive from Hazard uh, Avenue on the south to Enfield uh, Street uh, excuse me Elm Street on the north with maybe the, the, the Coles uh, complex, that that would be the mall area portion of it. 
The Thompsonville area essentially is all of the commercial properties uh, that are in the Thompsonville neighborhood. We did not include the residential portion of it. So anywhere where you would end up seeing some mixed use development around the transit facility, along the, the river, those are the areas that we really thought would be most uh, important to, to target. We worked with the town uh, uh, tax assessor, uh, the finance director, the development uh, uh, director to determine what the boundaries of this district would be. And that's on the sheet that's uh, in front of the members of the public. We wanted to make sure under the state statute, only, you can only have up to 10% of the total real estate value of the property incorporated into a district. This district represents approximately, after the uh, certification of the grand list, about 7% of the uh, taxable uh, property in the community. So there's still the possibility to create TIF districts in other areas of the community. We thought, felt that that was really important that you would have that uh, capacity going forward. A couple of other things. There is the possibility to give uh, incentives to developers. It's called a credit enhancement agreement. There is going to be an entire process by which any developer would uh, make a request to the community. There's criteria that you will establish uh, going forward as to what's the level of investment they need to make and how much you would be willing to rebate uh, taxes back to them. But there will be a process, and it would be a but-for argument. They have to demonstrate why it is important for them uh, to, to get that financing. So it's not an automatic uh, giveaway. It is a process to determine uh, filling a gap in needed revenue for a particular project that you deem worthy and uh, something that you would want in, in your community. So that's a quick overview. There's also being recommended a TIF advisory committee that would have representatives of your council, uh, Planning and Zoning, Conservation Commission, uh, and would incorporate the Director of Development Services, the uh, Assessor, uh, the uh, Director of Finance, as well as the Town Attorney. And they would make recommendations going forward to you on all of matters related to TIF. So we're really built in protections for the community, so this is ultimately a really great tool uh, for for your town. And with that, I'll answer thank any questions. No, thank no, you, sir. Not open for questions, no, but no. wasn't 30 seconds, but yeah. you did a very good job. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, open to the public. Marianne. So I'll just mention, this will be coming back. We referred it to planning and zoning. The 90 days would actually be our last meeting um, in May, but we don't want to, the town attorney right. felt we have a little cushion, so the first meeting of June, we'll vote on it. We can then address all of these other questions we might have and uh, also set the committee that uh, Patrick spoke about. Mary Ann Turner, um, I sit on the Economic Development Committee, and I've, I Seven Meadow Road, Enfield, Connecticut. I sit on the Economic Development Committee with a, probably a dozen people, and the TIF was one of the projects that was brought forward by Michael Sorello when he was still here. And I was part of that team, and there was four of us who kind of put this together, and we met with uh, Patrick actually in my living room one summer day. And I will tell you that the, we're very excited that we have moved forward so quickly. And not because it's not a great idea, it is an absolutely perfect idea for Enfield. And we really um, hope that the public will see it that way. One of the best things to look at is Windsor Locks actually had an article in the paper this past week. And they talked about the TIF that they implemented using the Montgomery building, which most of you probably are aware of. And in the, they, are, they are meeting to, to discuss how they'll use the $183,000 that's in their TIF wedge. Now, I don't know if they did 100% or not. I'm not following it that closely. But the fact that they have, they've already have some increase is so really important that'll show why it's so important for Enfield to take advantage of this opportunity. And we strongly, really um, like the idea that uh, it's, I, I thought it was 6% that we're putting in the Thompsonville area, not seven. But it's really important that we have that additional, because we cannot have more than 10% of the town 
This will allow us to look at places in Hazardville or Skidiko as we move forward. And because this process will be the first one that we've put into play, we'll easily see how it works. But it will not mean that we won't be moving forward. Economic development may come back to you maybe quite quickly with another TIF idea in another part of town because this will work and there's no real cost in the end. It's, it's a win, win, win. So I'm here tonight to say from the Economic Development as one of its members that I am so excited about it and I'm really thankful that we're moving forward and I, wa I was watching the uh, planning and zoning and they have already approved it so things are moving along so kudos to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak on this specific issue? And while we're waiting for the next speaker, I'll just add to uh, Representative Arnone. He had sent me that information about how much they generated already, and I sent it to the council. And it's interesting to note they actually generated about double that, but they had given a tax enhancement, and the balance left still was 180000 Thank you. Welcome. Kelly Hemmler, 10 Harford Ave. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm definitely in favor of the TIF. Um, the TIF looks like it's one of the puzzle pieces that we need to revitalize Thompsonville and the mall areas. I'm very excited about it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak specifically on this issue? Going. No, no worries. Hmm. It's specific to the TIF or the. It yeah, is. Yeah. I know. I'm just moving slow. I apologize. No worries. Welcome. Um, Marie Pisner, 25 Roy Street. Um, I, too, am part of the economic development team. Um, and I had the pleasure of actually meeting Patrick um, about a year ago when Mike Cirillo was part of the team. And um, I loved his ideas then, and I loved what he did in other towns. And I think he just brings a fresh set of eyes. Um, I think the TIF can work. I think it can help us not only develop Thompsonville, but I'm going to mimic what Mary Ann said. It can move us out into the Skidiko and the Hazardville area. Um, again, I think it's a win-win, um, and I would appreciate the support of the council. I know economic development has been working really hard on it, so I think with Patrick on board, we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you. I would also like to speak specifically on the tax incentive financing. Going once. Anyone would like to speak twice, second time? Going twice. I declare this public communication closed. We move right on to the next public hearing, uh, March 18, 2019. Um, public hearing ground rules. A public hearing has been scheduled to allow interested citizens an opportunity to express their opinions regarding the mid. Oops. Okay. Uh, a public hearing has been scheduled to allow interested citizens an opportunity to express their opinions regarding the fiscal year 2019 Community Development Block Grant Program. We'll call, please. Councilor Bosco. Councillor Sakala. Here. Councillor Prasadi. Here. Councillor Davis. Here. Councillor Denny. Here. Councillor Kiner. Here. Mayor Ludwig. Here. Councillor Muller. Here. Councillor Sferraza. Here. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Here. Councillor Ungeyer. Here. So 11 members present, none are absent. Following notice of public hearing was published in the Hartford Current Monday, March 4th and Wednesday, March 13th, 2019, Town of Enfield Legal Notice. The Enfield Town Council will hold a public hearing in the Enfield Town Hall. Council Chambers, 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, on Monday, March 18th, 2019, at 7.03 p.m., to allow interested citizens an opportunity to express their opinions regarding the fiscal year 2019 Community Development Block Grant Program. If unable to attend, okay, no, 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 uh, announce ground rules for the public hearing, there is no time limit. If unable to attend a public hearing, you may, you may direct written comments to the, town, to the Town of Enfield, Office of Community Development at 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, 06082, or you may telephone 860-253-6391. In addition, information may be obtained at the above address between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. on weekdays. Announce ground rules of the public hearing. There's no time limit, but I ask each person not to take up too much time so everyone has the opportunity to speak. After each person who desires has had one chance to speak, we shall permit those individuals who desire a second chance. After those individuals who desire a second chance, we shall permit those individuals a third, fourth, etc. Please refrain from personalities to kick off the public hearing. If you yes. Can, a little we brought our yeah. Deputy Director Nelson, Scott Bertrand, uh, the Housing Authority, and they'll explain the uh, proposed grant application. Welcome. Just name and title and sure. yep, public Good hearing. Good evening. Uh, Nelson Tereso, Town of Enfield, Office of Community Development. Scott Bertrand, Enfield Housing Authority. Welcome. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. And you, now, got, you got a minute. 
So we gave him 30. Possibly two. Yeah. As required um, by the um, Community Development Block Grant Program, uh, we at the town are required to hold a public hearing to obtain public comment on a new application for $350,000 in grant funding for this new uh, 2019 application round under the CDBG program. It's administered by the State Department of Housing and funds, are, funds come through the federal government through the um, Housing and Urban Development. It's, not a, it's a competitive grant program and there's not a local or town match required as part of the grant application. Now there are three objectives, national objectives, objectives to the CDBG grant program. To benefit low to moderate income people, to, uh, aid and prevent the elim to aid and prevent elimination of slums or blight, and to meet a community development need having a particular urgency. The project we are proposing intends to uh, benefit low and moderate income people because we are make, we're striving to make improvements towards two neighborhoods in town up to 100 residential units that are all 100% of uh, low to moderate income people. There are three goals to the CD, CDBG program. Promote in, and enhance fair housing, expand and preserve affordable housing, and promote and enhance suitable living conditions, which we feel this uh, application does. Now, when you had your last town council meeting, the request was only for $150,000. We then had meetings with the Department of Housing, Scott and I, to discuss the application. They felt that we needed to add another activity in order to strengthen our application just because the improvements at Green Valley Village were just sidewalks, walkways, and driveways. They wanted to see um, direct improvements done on the actual residential units. So we are also proposing to do electrical upgrades throughout Laurel Park, which is the neighboring um, neighborhood um, that's next to uh, Green Valley Village. Now our request is for 350. The Infield Housing Authority is going to be leveraging $40,000. They've committed to $40,000 to do all the engineering and planning. So it's, this is going to be a shovel-ready project. We're not coming to the state for any planning money. It's all hard costs. And they're also providing in-kind services of up to $15,000 to monitor and um, administer the, the project. The town of Infield will be administering the grant. My office would be. So with that being said, I'm going to kick it to Scott to discuss just the scope of the project. It's, 15 seconds, Mr. Mayor? You got it, sir. Okay. So really quickly, uh, as, as Nelson said, Laurel Park, what we're looking to do is we have 90 units there. We need to upgrade the electrical services. So on uh, 85, roughly, uh, of the units there, we need, we're going to replace the service wire from the DMARC to the meter box, the meter box, meter box, the panel, replace the panels. And straightforward, uh, we'll do the engineering. And as we originally discussed, the uh, Green Valley section, we already have zoning approval on this one. Uh, remove the uh, um, the circle, half circle driveway that's about halfway down the road there and replace it with the double driveways, which is consistent with the rest of the neighborhood there. And then uh, four other driveways that left to be done and then the paving sidewalks in that area will be done. Great. Is that 15 seconds? So we'll be voting on this later. They, if you want to stick around, you will give you more time then. Is that all right? If you guys want to stick around, because we're going to be voting this later, right? Is this on the agenda? I don't believe so. No, this is just the public hearing. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, we gave you the authority to yeah, enter it. Excuse me? We give you the authority to enter into it. Yep. Um, it's, it's item E, so it's the first item of the agenda. If you two would stick around, it will give you more time to talk. Great. Thank All you. Right? Thank you. It Appreciate it. it. It's item E. Okay. All right, so they, if, they can, if they want to stick around. Sure. So we give them some more time. So anyone like specifically to speak on this public hearing? <coughs> specifically on the, the block grants? Going once. Going twice, declare the public. Yeah, it, uh, it's, that's a different grant. We, we last time we, we moved to set the public hearing. This is the public hearing. That's a different grant. Okay. This has already been approved by the council. Okay, got it. Okay, good. All right. Sorry, guys. Declare this public communicate uh, hearing closed. We are a few minutes late. We're starting the, the general meeting. So that's a different grant. Sorry. All right. I was trying to give him more time. I was trying to give him more time. It's Thank okay because we're applying for a lot of money. We're looking for the yeah. money, Mr. Yeah. Mayor, so it's easy to get confused. So uh, good evening, everyone. Tonight is Monday, March 18th. Uh, the regular meeting will be underway. Sorry for we are about eight minutes late. Um, prayer, Deputy Mayor Suzak. I have a thing on my desk, and I look at it every day, and it says, we must change to stay the same. All change must embrace our past, our present, and prepare us for the future. We must weigh all change 
with our hearts and our heads and work together to keep Enfield a vibrant community. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number three, roll call, please. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Here. Councillor Ungayer. Here. Councillor Bosco. Here. Councillor Sakala. Here. Councillor Crisotti. Here. Councillor Davis. Here. Councillor Denning. Here. Councillor Kiner. Here. Mayor Ludwig. Here. Councillor Muller. Here. Councillor Sferraza. Here. There's 11 in favor. 11 present. Moving on to item four, fire evacuation announcement. In case of a fire, we have exits in the back of the, uh, the room. Please exit left to right and go out orderly. Or to our left, the, the audience is right. We have, door, we have uh, doors right out there. Go down the first door to your left, down through the stairs, and out into the parking lot. In case of a fire. Item number five, minutes of the preceding meeting. We have a motion to approve the special meeting March 4th, 2018. So moved. Deputy so counted by Councilor Muller, seconded by... Councilor Crisotti, any omissions, deletions, changes to the minutes? Hearing none by show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed, any deletions, abstentions? Excuse me, abstentions. 11 in favor, zero against. Do I have a motion for the regular meeting of March 4, 2018? So moved. By Councilor Second. Muller, seconded by Councilor Crisotti. Any deletions, additions, corrections? Hearing none by show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed, any abstentions? 11 in favor, zero against. We are now moving on to item six. Again, we appreciate everyone's patience. Only 10 minutes late, so that's not too bad. Um, we have special, we are honored tonight to have three special guests. We have Senator John Kissel, Representatives Tar Tom Arnone and Carol Hall. If you folks would please come up and tell us all the good news you're gonna tell us. <laughs> I guess the junior guy will stand. <laughs> <laughs> no, we might be. Oh, yeah, there you go. I always got my back, I'll take that. I'm trying, cousin. <laughs> so uh, welcome. Appreciate you being here tonight. Again, uh, this is very important, so we appreciate it. And um, uh, just your name and title, and then the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. State Senator John Kissel. Carol Hall, State Rep of the 59th. And Tom Arnone of the 58th. Welcome, everyone. So I, I don't know if you guys have a prepared statement, or do you just want to go right into Q&A? I'll leave it up to you guys. So You want to open? Yeah. All right, let, let me just jump in on a couple things. Uh, Mayor, as I'm sure you're aware, and hopefully the rest of the council, uh, the money for JFK was uh, at a public hearing today at noon uh, before the Education Committee. I went and checked it out. Looks like, you know, we were second in the list of uh, allotments. Typically, that bill doesn't have a problem having legs and getting through because so many people have an interest. There's a huge chunk of money that's uh, in there for the city of Bridgeport for uh, one of their high schools being renovated. So there'll be a lot of folks that have an interest in that bill. So I'm assuming everything went smoothly at the public hearing. I don't know if the town submitted anything in support of the proposal, but uh, I'm sure that'll be moving in. My office will keep an eye on that. Second, and I know that we had spoken about this on Friday, Mr. Mayor, the concern about municipalities being able to sue for opioids, uh, there's a couple bills in judiciary that I could offer an amendment to, but as I think I had indicated to you last week, uh, the co-chairs are pretty firm in not wanting to move anything forward. So there is no standalone bill. I saw the emails that were sent, and, and the rationale is completely fine, I understand. Uh, you know, why the city of New Haven and Mayor Harp or the uh, city of Bridgeport and Mayor Joe Gannam aren't pushing the co-chairs, I don't know. Maybe the co-chairs are getting marching orders from, you know, Marty Looney and Joe Arasimowitz because they want to keep this to the state. Uh, but if, you, if, the, if, if it's the will of the council, uh, while I'm in the Judiciary Committee, to offer an amendment just to see if it flies, uh, but again, if the co-chairs are against it, even if by some miracle it, it, a bill gets amended, they just would never call the bill on the floor. So, so it's an uphill battle. I don't know if there's like any lobbyists down there to help with this effort. Certainly there's like, I think over 12 municipalities have a, have a dog in this fight. And so there, there are some folks out there that could be supportive, but the impediment seems to be uh, the judiciary co-chairs. Uh, as far as tolls go, uh, you know, clearly it's been noted that Enfield 
took a stand on that issue. So did the city of Stanford and I think other municipalities. Uh, unlike judiciary where we create bills and then have hearings on the precise language, transportation works differently. They have subject matter hearings, so there was a subject matter on tolling, but there was no details. And so people came and testified on the concept, but we still haven't seen any detailed proposal from the administration regarding that initiative. And there's a concern that there's another standalone bill that would create a, a, a highway or transportation authority that would make these decisions without the legislature taking a vote. Philosophically, I don't support that whatsoever because I think that we get elected to be your voice and to take a vote and whether folks like it or not like it, we have a record as opposed to, as opposed to some quasi-governmental entity that who knows what they're going to do. Uh, so those are just three things I wanted to touch bases on. I'll turn it over to Carol. Thank you. Uh, I, I, just a quick comment. Uh, I did talk with Tammy uh, right before I left the Capitol today, and tolls will be coming out of committee on Wednesday. So there should be a vote on uh, tolls Wednesday out of committee. So we'll know a little bit more as far as, you know, what's coming out. Um, but like John said, there's really no specifics as far as detail in it yet. But of course, by Wednesday, we should have a little bit more uh, as far as details in the actual bill that comes out. Um, I can't talk to the judiciary decision on the opioids because I'm not on that subcommittee. So this year, my subcommittees are public safety, appropriations again, and uh, ranking on higher ed. So a little different for me this year. Last year was education. Um, this year, they moved me up to higher ed and gave me ranking, which was a little bit of a uh, surprise to me, but it, it was a nice compliment. So um, higher ed's got all their bills out already, so we're done with the committee work for higher ed. We're now moving on to appropriations, which is going to be very, very busy over the next month and a half. Um, we have the governor's bill that everybody saw. I did forward the numbers to um, Mayor uh, Ludwig and uh, Town Manager Chris Bromson on what the numbers look like for Enfield over the next two years in the governor's proposed budget. It hasn't gone through appropriations yet, so it's going to obviously probably change, I would think, uh, through the process a little bit. But um, as it sits right now, it's, it's very favorable. Um, you probably all got the numbers, I'm sure, from the town manager. But for year 20, um, the first year out of the budget, so this coming year, you're in the, the plus of $242,165. These are total dollars to the town, so it includes ECS and your uh, muni aid. So year two, you're even better off by about half a million. It's 549172 so the way the governor's budget stands right now, it looks really good for Enfield, which we're really happy about. Um, we'll just have to see what happens as it works its way through appropriation. So um, I'll turn it over to Tom, and I don't know if you have- For what's left? Yeah, so, well, <laughs> No, that's good. No, yeah. I just, I'll touch on the numbers too, because that was, a, uh, you know, the governor's uh, budget right now is everything, because we know very little on, on anything to sit here and talk about tolls or specific bills. We're just starting to vote these bills out of committee. Um, so we, we haven't seen a lot of my, I have seen the one that uh, the senator was talking about, and, and it's not a favorable thing for us to have to wait on the 15 days. If it doesn't come before the legislature in 15 days, as one particular bill says, that the authority will have the authority. Um, and uh, not a favorable bill on anyone that sits here. I, I, I feel the same way. Uh, um, I, I actually think there's way too many gantries that are being proposed at this this point. And, uh, you know, I've always said 95, you can, that's a, that's a toll road that's been told from Florida to Maine. I don't know why we stopped doing it. Um, so there is compromise and, and there's a long road ahead of us in everything, including the governor's bill. Again, very favorable for Enfield. Uh, increases of, you know, 341,000, 355,000 in school uh, funding alone. Um, the only thing that is not flat on the town side is the, uh, the LOSEP grant. 
And the only reason a low sub grant is lower this year is because Governor Malloy had more money in it last year, and this year it'll be uh, five million lower. So it's it's a cut to everyone. So we did we did flat for the town. So that that's good, you know, because I know what you guys got to do next. And it's like me asking you, you know, what's our mill increase going to be? You don't know, and we don't know with a lot of this either. So the patience is in everything right now, and and that's what we're trying to. Uh, uh, you know, uh, just navigate through this whole thing. So the governor, too, in a little side note, um, uh, he sees a projection in, in school funding till 2028 of an increase for Enfield. Because of the formulas, there's two formulas out there, which, as you know anything about school funding, these formulas are, are everything in the detail. So what formula they actually land on will make a difference from the numbers that we're both saying tonight also. So everything is so, uh, um, you know, up in the air at this point. Uh, and because our budgets aren't on the same time frame, which is something I've seen a bill out there that wants to put municip municipalities on a federal um, time scale, which would be closer to uh, what the state does now so we don't have to play catch up. Because we're, we're not going to do anything till June. Uh, uh, so uh, you'll you'll be already done with your budget budget by then, and that's not fair. And, and uh, maybe in two years, if that bill doesn't come through, I'd like to introduce one to give you the opportunity to uh, move your time scale for your, uh, you know, your budget up. That's it. So um, just <clears throat> another uh, comment that I spoke with our ranking member um, on bonding today, and basically she told me that she did have a commitment from the new OPM uh, commissioner that none of the school project funding will be on the bonding diet. So um, we heard that right out of the governor's office. So I think we can feel pretty confident and I, I don't want to, I never say never right. because we saw what happened we're, to the budget last no, we're year. We're taking no chances tonight. Yeah, okay. exactly. We're no so chances. we're, we're going to take a very conservative uh, position on this, but I think we can feel pretty comfortable that, you know, the bonding for the school is, is very secure at this point. That's the guarantee from the governor's office at this point. So we'll see. Um, what else? I'm trying to think of something else. We. So you How guys open for questions? questions? So, Councilor yeah. Denny and Councilor Ferraza. To all three of you, uh, sewer money from corrections. I'd like you to, you know, we still haven't heard anything from them. It's in a bonding situation, I think, in the committee. And so, so maybe you can tell me more because okay, so I, I have, still have my fingers crossed that we're it's, it's a 2.5 million Ed's referring to. Right. Yeah. So the bonding, uh, the bonding uh, scheduled meeting for the 29th has already been canceled. So they won't be having a hearing on the 29th. What they are saying is that they're looking to April 2nd for the bonding uh, official meeting. So. We don't know what's going to be on the agenda at this point, still early, but as soon as we see that, we'll let you know right away. Of course, it's on all of our radars, so you have three people keeping their eye open and pushing for it. So um, we will we will let you know as soon as that goes on. Tom, you yeah, had something? Yeah, I, I just uh, ditto to that because one of the first uh, things I, I did, we, we got together and we wrote the letters and we, uh, you know, I learned a little bit about policy and procedures uh, going through this whole thing and, and how we work as a team. And, and you know, that's exactly what we're going to do and we've been doing. Uh, there's three of us here, but we're all one for Enfield. So we want to make sure you understand that, you know, we're, we're trying to pull that money out of them. It's there. We know it's there. Yeah. It's just when they meet. And, uh, you know, John probably knows a little more of that over the years and Carol of how they meet, which to me is a little bit of a mystery. And I've heard they, you know, they, they cancel the meetings quite often. Yeah, and Ed's le letter, it's, it's contractual, though, so I, yes. so can you explain, so I, I don't want to take Ed, so Ed, if you have the, oh, that's good. so the other, why is it, if it's contractual, why is it going to the bonding council? So that's the question. And I don't mean to take Ed's thunder, but that's, that's, I think, yeah, right. Well, my, my understanding is that when you say contractual, this is an agreement, long-standing Sign, agreement signed, that right, we've had document. with the Department of Corrections. Right where we just approved the new commissioner of corrections last week. So there was, you know, it was sort of on autopilot for the first month and a half. Uh, but also, I don't believe the Department of Corrections has the funding in their operating budget. They don't really have a, a bundle of like $2.5 million set aside. So 
this is an ask not only for the town of Enfield and the three of us, but this is a Department of Corrections ask as well. Okay. So one of the things I'll do this week uh, in, in lieu of the inquiry is I'll follow up with some of those folks that I know in the governor's office that we CC'd on the letter and see if I can't uh, track down any further concrete information regarding it. But okay. that that's why. Ed, you still have the floor. No, oh, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Councilor Sferraza. I just have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, I know recently the legislator had a public hearing on the casino in East Windsor, and from what we've read, it looks like MGM is lobbying hard to open it up to an RFP and something in Bridgeport. If we're, if this is going to happen here in East Windsor, I know Carol, you worked hard to get us some money. Uh, was it seven hundred thousand dollars to come back to us? What's the status of all that right now? So um, tomorrow in public safety, uh, those two bills, they're two separate bills. So there's an East Windsor bill for the casino, and we're calling the other one the MGM bill. Um, they're both being voted on at a committee tomorrow, so we'll know a lot more tomorrow. It's actually on, on an agenda I got tonight, and the language for the bills, some of the bills on that agenda just came out this evening. So um, we often get the language at the very last second, but those two bills are on tomorrow's agenda. Um, I think if I had to make a prediction, I'm guessing that both bills may make it out of committee. And then, of course, we'll have to wait to see what happens when they get to the floor and which one, if they call both, we may debate both of them. Um, but they're definitely going to be voted out of committee tomorrow one way or another. Um, so the money for Enfield and all the abutting towns is seven fifty a year guaranteed once the casino is open. So it's not a one-time deal, it's it's annually. So you'll you'll get through the state budget in our biennium budget one and a half million once that casino opens. So um, Senator Austin, who's been uh, very gracious and worked with me really hard to push for that money along with John um, and Greg when we fought for that money for Enfield, um, she is pushing a bill right now for the East Windsor Casino, which removes the government approval, which was put in the first bill that we passed out last year. And the reason she's doing that is basically half of the tribes, so it's, as some of you may know, it's a combined effort with two of the tribes. One of the tribes actually got the federal approval. Um, the government didn't want to approve the second tribe because they said it wasn't technically a compact, so they didn't have to approve it. It was an agreement. So there's a lot of fighting going back and forth with the lobbyists of MGM to basically um, one, block the casino, but also push the fact that they really felt that we needed that second approval. So Senator Austin's bill basically is to remove the federal approval um, from that bill. So I've signed on to the bill. Um, I don't, Tom, I think might have signed on to the bill as well, um, because basically it, sh it secures that money for Enfield, and that's that's a huge, huge help. Um, the folks in East Windsor obviously want the casino there. It's unanimous across their selectmen 100 percent. So that's where it stands right now. We'll know tomorrow uh, if one or both come out of committee, and then we'll have to see once it hits the floor. Okay. So, yep, yep. The one caveat I'd throw out regarding all this, uh, Carol's got it absolutely correct regarding what's happening legislatively, but I've just read numerous accounts that Governor Lamont wants to broker a deal uh, with both the tribes and MGM, and so he's doing stuff behind the scenes, and all of a sudden, in the next month, it could be something laid before the legislature as a fait accompli, and I don't know what that'll look like. And so the whole 750 may have to be revisited if that's not addressed in whatever Governor Lamont comes up with. And he, he has a strong interest, and he's stated many, many times he doesn't want uh, these issues tied up in the courts with lawyers. And if, and if, if you know, one side actually is prevailing, 
his concern is it's just going to end up stalled in, in the court somewhere and he just doesn't want that to happen. And the other sort of wrinkle to add on top of that is the whole sports betting and who has a right to the sports betting and, and, and that issue as well. So uh, Carol's absolutely correct, but, I, but don't be surprised if you wake up and one day you read in the paper that Governor Lamont has created some settlement with their, all the interested parties. It'll be interesting because the tribes have already come out and said they have no interest in doing any joint venture with MGM. So they've already dug their feet in in public hearings because we had all the casino hearings one day. Um, the tribes were there and, and they've said that there's, there's no way they're coming to the table to broker a deal with MGM. So we'll see. I mean, both sides are pretty dug in right now. Um, so like John said, you, you never know until you know. But. Yeah, just to, and to add to that, uh, in my recent meetings with the tribes, that, that they still are dug in and um, uh, willing to pay the 750000 to the surrounding town. So um, we've pretty much heard that uh, consistently. Um, and now it's just uh, time to get it up to vote. And that's, uh, that's what rules in the end. Carl, you go yeah. ahead. I may be mistaken, but I thought I read somewhere on the federal level there are calls for an investigation with the Interior or the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, how they, this whole process played out. So. Yeah, so, so the gentleman that was there um, actually uh, resigned, and they are investigating. They, they feel like there was some bad deals done, if you will. Um, and uh, they are investigating that right now. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it, it really got ugly. And MGM spent millions and millions of dollars in Washington lobbying pretty hard against the East Windsor Casino. So, and all the other casino bills, by the way, all the online gambling and online betting are coming out of uh, public safety tomorrow as well. So. Okay. Uh, my second question is teacher pensions. There was some talk about shifting some of that to the municipalities at 25%, but then I read somewhere where they said that if you're a distressed community, it would only be 5%. What, what's the deal with it's, that? It's, a, it's an interesting formula, and I, uh, I'll turn it over yeah. to Tom because <laughs> Tom probably has more detail. Um, I have the breakdowns for you on how much the actual uh, teacher pension is going to be for Enfield for the next two years, so I'll hand those out when we're done. Um, but it is, it is a calculated formula, and Enfield ends up, it, it's, it's a combination of what you're paying your teachers. So negotiated salary to your teachers, it's uh, part of it is um, uh, free lunches, so they take that into the formula as well, and your ECS funding. So it's, it's a combination, it's a very weird combination on what they came up with, but Right, so uh, money-wise, just to give you an idea, if, again, this is if, uh, nothing has uh, uh, been, uh, you know, voted on or has uh, been negotiated yet. So, uh, so for Enfield, in the first year of uh, 2020, we're looking at $46,000 it would cost the town of Enfield projected, and uh, in 2021 it would be $95,000 projected what our contribution, if this should pass, um, uh, to the state to cover anything above the, the medium inc uh, uh, the uh, average salary of a teacher in Connecticut so they, they broke it out so if you pay your teachers you know exorbitant fees like some uh, towns do you're going to pay more uh, we're we're down a little bit right now but uh, those are some of the estimated numbers uh, uh, from uh, from the state on that okay thank you and my last question is, um, and I guess with everything up in Hartford, it's a very fluent thing. Nothing is the way it is today. It's going to be tomorrow. But it's good to hear that this year it looks like we're not going to be looking at million-dollar cuts like we were last year. But I'm looking a year beyond that where I read that, you know, I know our state pension fund is woefully underfunded, um, and I hear projections of up to a billion-dollar deficit coming the following year. Yeah. Am I correct in that? John doesn't want to talk to the no, car, us no, want to talk to No, no, car, car, uh, <laughs> Councilman, you're it's exactly common. correct. And yeah. one of my concerns is that if the people in the majority side don't want to do any heavy lifting right now, 
we have a really flush rainy day fund. But all that does is mean that the difficult decisions will be in the future. So if we just, so if, if the ultimate result is to raid that rainy day fund to tamp down and ameliorate the tax consequences for this first year of the biennium, that's going to put a lot more pressure on the second year. And so hopefully what ends up happening, and I no longer serve on the Appropriations Committee, so I'll leave that to Carol, but hopefully they're looking at things that if you track it out that, and I'm not in favor of raising taxes by any means, but whatever happens, hopefully it will be grounded such that the second year is not impoverished at the benefit of the first year. And it's just a wait and see kind of thing, but that's a potentiality. So, uh, yeah, time, if you don't mind, so so as we say here, fund balance and I lo the rainy day fund, which is uh, I, I've been using that word, you know, from the local side of it. Um, fund balance in the compromise budget of of last year was rated, um, and that's how we got the, a lot of the money back for the school. So, you know, both sides take take a little bit of uh, uh, heat on on that rainy day fund. It ended up at a billion over. Right, and it's all because of hedge fund uh, taxes and income tax. It was unexpected money that came to the coffers. They expect some of that this year. Um, te uh, retirement funds as a whole are uh, most of the. It's only, and I hate to throw uh, teachers under the bus, but it's only the teacher funds, uh, pension funds, right now that are really uh, in trouble. And and the the proposal is to have all the winnings from the lottery to start paying that back. Because you know, since 1938, we've not funded our pensions, and you know, I, you've heard it all. 1938, and we haven't, but the employees have been paying into it. So again, it, it falls unfortunately on everybody else's shoulders in the future and then it's our bond our bonds in the future that's why the bond diet is coming in and you all know this too locally they can only bond so much we went a little bond happy and now we're we're paying for it because that's where the money really shoots up in the next couple of years is the bond repayment um, so we have to take take reins of that bond uh, money right away not to be confused with JFK because that's uh, past money, but in the future it's going to be a little tighter to get the, right. that uh, get you know roads and so they go right back to the toll issue roads and and highways fixed because we're not going to be bonding as much as we we have. See, I'm concerned about that projection of a billion dollars oh, yeah. because you know um, clearly that impacts Enfield. There's going to be less money to share with the Absolutely. communities. We know the the cities are getting more than their share of monies. And you know what? I'm just skeptical because I remember when the lottery was put in place and, and then we had the special transportation fund money that was raided and then, of course, the gas tax, and our state income tax. And it just seems I hear no discussion at all up in Hartford. And I watched that public hearing on tolls. I didn't hear any legislators talking about any proposed spending cuts. I just keep hearing how do we get revenue, 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 but we're not offsetting it with any, not even any discussion about it, so. So, and it's true, if you listen to the governor's speech, he, his speech was to move forward. Um, and he does, there isn't a lot of, of, uh, of uh, cuts in there. There are some, but not enough as a lot of people would like to see. And that is yet to come. So it, as we, um, see, this is the fine line we, we have to travel as legislators, because now as we start cutting back on this sugary tax, that sugary tax, it's all going to come home to roost, because now we're going to have to make that up. So we're going to either have to make it up with cuts, or we're going to have to make it up with cuts to municipalities. So that's where really the, you know, the, the shovel hits the ground in the next couple of months, is how we're going to balance the cuts, the taxes, and money home which is the most important part right now. So that, that's, that's a tough wrestle. Talk to us in, uh, Deputy in Mayor uh, May. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> then Councilor Prasadi. I guess I want to just keep going a little bit on the pensions. I mean, right now, most of our state workers are on a defined benefit, which allows the state to play around, and do games, and do whatever they want. Is there a full commitment to go to a defined contribution plan? which is highly regulated, and the state will have to put that money in on a yearly basis. It will make the employees more accountable, and it will make the state more accountable. And I do have to remind the state that they did pass a new 8% pass-through entity tax, 
And as far as I know, we don't know what's going to happen with that because that took all unincorporated businesses that were passed through and put an 8% tax on it. I mean, you're going to get your 8% from our income tax, but this is a tax that supposedly is going to flow back. So we haven't seen how that's, that's all flowed out of these businesses at 8%. And now it's going to be flowing to the individual taxes at I don't know what rate. But the thing is, is sometimes, as, you know, Carl's saying, it's a moving target. I mean, you know, the, the amount of money goes up like this, but there's a commitment for other money. But for me, as a person who spent a lot of time in business, you've got to go to a defined contribution, and we have to do what we have to do because we can't sustain, you know, early retirements and people, you know, four people doing the same job. And we do have a lot of pensions that exceed the federal, you know, quarter million dollars that they're supposed to receive from, you know, from a, a state agency. So, I mean, we're, we're f kind of frustrated here, and it's, it's nice to hear that we might be getting money, but I'm always worried about what bill they're going to send me that I have to pay, and that's always what scares me. But I really appreciate all the hard work, and I know you guys are going to be working even harder over the next couple of weeks, but thank you for coming. Just quickly, Donna, they, they, the, all uh, new, new pensions are hybrids now, so th there's a hybrid 401K and regular pension now, so it's saved the state incredible amount of money for the next 20 and 30 years. So, yes, they're moving in that, that direction, I don't have the answer for the 8%. I'll have to email it to you. They're, keep you posted. Thank you. They're actually working on the 8%. They got a lot of complaints, Donna, last year on that. So um, they are trying to fix that. So you, you should see a fix on that this year is what, what I'm hoping for anyway. It's really sad when you have all these changes in the ta federal taxes and they say, oh, in New York, Connecticut, and California, you guys are going to see nothing. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, we're really lumped in with some of the bigger, high-powered states. So it's it's interesting because you, you everybody's talking about where to cut, and it's just to give you an example of of some of the mentality at at the state level is nobody's looking to cut. I have to say it's it's very difficult to be in committees. And for example, I'll give you in higher ed, they're talking about free college. So it, for everybody you know it's like okay um, we're, we don't fund our primary and secondary levels of education right now and now you want to add on two more years you know philosophically it's a great idea we all wish we could do that but once we can meet our present obligations to the towns and municipalities then come and talk to us about two years of free college I think it's a great idea but we don't have the money we don't we can't fund what we're what we're obli obliged to fund now so why are we going to add another two years that was one of the bills that came out of higher ed which I it's just it's disingenuous because quite frankly there's no way it's going to get through appropriations um, but those are the kind of things you're dealing with you know so I don't know. thank you Councilor Grisotti good evening thanks for uh for attending tonight, greatly appreciate it. Question that I have, has there been any communication with the three of you, uh, with the new commissioner from the Department of Transportation to discuss the advancement of the train station? <laughs> So, so we are Tom we are right in the we're right in the uh, we just had uh, email out today we're, we're right in the middle of getting that meeting set for April. Mm -hmm. So um, again, uh, it's all uh, uh, we'll have more next time we come in after April on on what's discussed at that point. But yeah, we, we hope to to meet on the uh, on the 11th. 11. Uh, 11th and we, we just wait for John's office to get back to us. That's how. Oh. That's how uh, this is just unfolding. So um, then we look like there's no problem. We're in the middle of, uh, we'll probably be in session at the time. So it's an extremely hard time. And, and Carol had had the idea that, you know, get the commissioner to come over the uh, legislative office building, which would probably make it, I don't even know if John had uh, known that yet, but you do now. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it make it easier on us to, to actually meet with him and talk about the, the train station. He came before the Transportation Committee uh, prior to actually being voted upon just to introduce himself and his background. And I didn't really ask him the question 
during the public hearing portion, but I jumped up when it was all over, ran over to him, and because his sister and brother-in-law live in my part of Granby, and so there was sort of a little hook, and so I put the bug in his head about the train station immediately at that time, uh, and he said that give him a few weeks and he'll get back to us. So it's that sort of so he's so he knew that that meeting was is coming down the road, and uh, we'll see what we can do. Although there was some discouraging news yes. about where they want to put all their rail dollars, and mm. I don't know if you want to share that, Tom. Well, it was but a 20, if, if you even listen to the governor's speech, it was 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, and all those 20 minutes were running south right. of Hartford. So that was a little discouraging, and, and some private conversation that we were able to, to uh, uh, get from the governor also uh, gave me that impression that the money were, were going uh, south of Hartford. But at the same time, um, he also recommended that we get the meeting with the commissioner. So it's, it's uh, a, a kind of a delicate situation right now for the North. And again, we don't want to be left out, and uh, we're going to do everything we can to act like six people, not six, not three. So <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep the pressure on them. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> sorry <laughs> so, to, sorry to bring up a touchy <laughs> subject, but, but an important one. No, we're, we're all on the same no. yeah, that's great. Well, thank you. Um, one other uh, question that, that I just want. With the magic uh, bus here in town, is there any way that we can get the the routes expanded more around town instead of the east to west, north to south? Yeah, well, I think it's, that's it's the grant, right? You're speaking the state. The state is is funding it. Um, Only part. Correct. The state funds. Yeah, I think we could talk to Don, uh, the director, on that. We have a lot more discretion in the routes. Um, for instance, we're, we're asking for, we're applying for a grant this evening for one more bus, um, so we can talk to her about the actual route schedules. I think we have All a right, lot more I, I thought for that. I had to. Well, so it, you can only do with so many dollars you have. Go through the right. uh, state legislature. If you could get that increased, right. it would be, uh, would be the ideal uh, thing to do. Uh, it's a little late now, but um, to try to get that grant money and that's John's department. He's on transportation. So, um, but we'll, we'll I don't know how that works. We'll work with your town manager and figure out what All right, great. Okay, because <laughs> I know that there's uh, you know there's a lot of people that are around town without the public transportation that have to attend meetings and they have a very difficult time and they're not can't qualify for a dial a ride type program. So. Yeah. We'll follow up, and I, I would just like to um, voice my appreciation to all three, John and Carol and Tom. Mm -hmm. You may see them only once every few months, but I'm in constant and regular communication with all three of their offices on all of these issues, and they're very, very responsive. They immediately respond, and we share a lot. They're doing a lot of hard work on behalf of the town, and they don't ever, there's no delay time in them responding to me with a, a phone call or an email, and it really is a wonderful working relationship to have with our state legislators because we're all in it together, and we can't do it alone, and I very much appreciate the help that they give my office. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. So not to belabor the point, but the agreement we have with the $2.5 million from the prisons, it actually says in the agreement, timely payment. <laughs> So well, we're talking to state here. So <laughs> Tom, you were, Tom, you're on the council when we start talking Mike. about this. Oh, I know. It's so six months of just want, I just want yeah, you re, when you know. talk to those folks. Just remind them it's state time. Written yeah. agreement. <laughs> so uh, I just want only think about. So I, I think you know my position on tolls. Yeah. But I think if people should really read the report that was the decision that was based on, mm -hmm. and, and and my my real fundamental problem with the tolls, if you read the report. So over the last 20 to 30 years, we've heard how we want to become energy independent, which I think a lot of folks have done, take it to heart, save the environment. So a lot of people have not purchased the SUVs. They've actually got very efficient cars. They've done, they may take the bus. They've done a lot of things where, again, we pay the, one of the highest gas taxes in the nation. That's a fact. I think we're second behind Illinois, I believe. So that's a fact. So the interesting thing is because people have actually taken that to heart and are now are actually doing the things they should do, where they're buying a more energy efficient car, maybe they're not driving as much as they used to, they're car carpooling with someone else in the minivan as opposed to doing it themselves, the report actually says right in the writing, well, we need to find more revenue. So we're penalizing good behavior. That's what the, that's what the problem with this is, is that we're penalizing good behavior. And, and again, you can, our, our, that's my point, is that if you want the taxpayer to do the right thing, then don't penalize them when they do the right thing. And I'm sorry, the tolls are a tax. 
Mm -hmm. we can sit here and argue about it all around. But if you're actually going to read the report, they want it because people, they're getting less tax revenue from the highest gas tax in the nation because people are doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is actually buying more car, energy efficient cars, which help the environment. Well, so plus, that, so plus, that's what kills me about it. So I'm sorry, that's just a statement, and I don't mean to put you on a... Yeah. Plus and, I, and I encourage everyone to read that report, because that's the basis of the bills that are before you folks. But, you know, it's I, and I agree with you, Mike. Um, I think one other thing is, you know, the legislature has swept the transportation funds numerous times. So, you know, the good right. intentions of lockboxes and everything. I mean, we just voted on that lockbox on this last November, and yet the, the governor's budget right. came out and he swept the transportation Which funds in his budget. For lock, so lock it's, box. There's a lot of people who voted for that. It's it's very frustrating. Um, yep. And we just to answer, we do have the forum on the 16th for the tolls. Looking forward um, to it, actually. So that's going to be a JFK for the audience watching. So uh, I don't recall yeah. the time. Is it six o'clock, John? Yeah, six o'clock. I, I think six to seven thirty. Yeah. And. Uh, our former deputy mayor, uh, Bill Lee, has been working with my office because he had some traffic issues and hallway issues, and so staff are going to go and do a little mini tour of the middle school. Uh, just on the uh, revenues, though, you're correct that everybody's doing the right thing, but I was quite surprised that when asked over and over and over at a transportation at the, uh, at the hearing on tolls, uh, the new uh, secretary of the Office of Policy and Management, when questioned, said, no, the uh, taxes from the gasoline is, are not going down. They're level. Uh. But they're projected to stay level for five to six more years. So, so now they're talking about, oh, well, you know, in my view, politically, deep into the future. Once you get past five or six years, who knows? You know, things change so much technologically. But there's no huge pressing need now if they prioritize the projects they want to do. But at that public hearing, they start rattling off all these projects all over the state of Connecticut like they want to do it all at once. And, you know, just like when you're running your household, if you want to do something in your kitchen or you got a problem in the bathroom, you don't do it all at once. You, you sort of stagger it out and figure out what can the family afford. And we have to try to get that through the Department of Transportation's noggin. And, and I'll, sorry, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Just yeah. add to that, too. Uh, again, that's part of the, the negotiation process from here to June. Um, of course, when you when you're in negotiations, you're going to reach for the high the high spot right now, and you're going to want the 800 million dollars. But is that what you can have? Is that what you can afford? So so that's where we're going to have to you know make sure our votes. Um, and that's why I say everything's on the table. As far as I'm concerned, everything's on the table, and I can't afford to show my hand. Uh, you, you show your hand to your chest. You don't flip it the other way over. And and until that day comes where we need to, or they come to me and say, hey, I need your vote. Well, let's talk about gantries, right. uh, and let's talk about Anfield. I'm not asking you. I'm not asking any of you publicly. I just say, just, just remember that the purpose is not to, to penalize good behavior. That's all my only. I, I agree. That's it. I'm I not agree. asking at all. So I appreciate your position. All three of your positions. I'm not asking at all. So the last thing, and I'll stop. To your point, John, about the public hearing, I, I can't speak for the council about, you, you know. So as we talked a little bit about, you know, the lawsuit that was have against, I think it was Purdue Pharma. So, so the issue, and I, and I agree, if the two largest cities who are part of that aren't going to lobby there, who is the chairperson of the, the committee, I think from my perspective, I don't want to speak for anyone else, is that, and again, I can't, I apologize if this is wrong, but I, I remember that we didn't get, the, the money from the tobacco settlement didn't filter down to the municipalities. So I think that's the general, when we went into this, and I'll just speak for myself, the, the goal wasn't really about the money. It was like, if we, whatever money we got, we want to make sure we try to solve the problem, which I don't think was the result of the tobacco money. I think it more went to the general fund. Again, you guys can disagree with me. I'm just saying, no, remember what I remember about the issue. And I, and I think the other issue is that I think we're the only state that is suing and not allowing the municipalities to actually participate in that, that lawsuit. And I think that's the two things that, you know, we were kind of, you know, through the, we were talking to that we were just saying, well, why couldn't we just have a public hearing? Yeah, you know, and that was you know that was sort of my my reach to you, and I you know so I don't want to speak for other members of the council, but if right if the chairperson's town of New Haven is not you know is not yeah. going to change, yeah you know, I, I, yeah yeah I mean, I'll uh, defer to you on that. Yeah. Well, the, well, part of the the nuanced problem is that the, our deadline to raise bills had already come and right, gone right. before we n knew about this. That doesn't mean that we don't have something that might be somewhat germane. 
And I, like I said, I already have uh, my one of my staff attorneys looking for now. The concern I have is if I have bills that colleagues really want, I don't want to jeopardize those bills. But right. there's one generic o opioid bill that might be a vehicle to at least have the discussion. But it would be at the process of the, at the, the time of a meeting on a vote of the bill unless I can find out, I don't, I'll find out if we haven't had a public hearing. If I can nail down when that generic bill has a public hearing, I would say come and testify or at least submit testimony. Right. It may not be directly on point, but it's, it would allow me to then follow up with the co-chairs once again. But yeah, New Haven and Bridgeport taking a step back and saying we don't care makes it really hard for me. To, right. no, I understand. To, to get yep. that done, but I'm, I'll look for. Again, I'll be in contact with the town manager, and yep. well, I'll I'll get you. And that was really an the ability that, to that speak was the ask, on that. right? Yep. And by the way, I read you know the six items; they're all very valid. Right. Yep. So I just Thank want, you. I just glad, want yep. to add one more quick thing on Monday um, in public health. They're hearing opioid opioid bills. Um, I talked to Doc Pettit today before I left, and there's one in particular bill that I want to put the invite out, especially to uh, Councillor Safraza, I want to say Chief Safraza, um, because he's got to put on his, his other hat on Monday. But it's, it's the custody bill um, for the overdoses. And there's been, just so the council knows, there's been um, actually a bipartisan bills from both sides of the aisle put in on this particular issue of custody. So if Narcan is administered by our EM, EMS or by police or our first responders, then it will give the police officers the ability to take the person to the hospital. So right now they can't do anything, as you all know. They can't take uh, these folks into custody and get them help. Um, they just have to let them go. And we've experienced many times that people come back and overdose again and, and are administered Narcan again, and then they get up and walk away again. So it's, it's kind of, it's boiled up. We, we put bills in, I put bills in the last term. It was a little different with the language. This time it's, it's kind of, come to a head, I think, and finally it looks like it's going to have bipartisan support. So that's going to come out in public health on Monday. So I'm going to reach out to Chief Fox because he also spoke to me at the very, actually John and I both met with him at the beginning of a session on this particular bill. So uh, anybody that wants to come in, up and testify, but especially reach out to Chief Fox and Chief Safraza. I'd love to see you there on Monday for this one. So that's my committee, actually. I unfortunately had to leave tonight. They're still in public se uh, public uh, meeting right now in public hearing. Uh, so there's two bills on the floor, Carol's and um, uh, um, another re representative's bill. Um, I've sponsored one of them. The only issues are is how long you, you, can you hold the person in the hospital? Um, I think you had 40, 72 hours, 72 hours up to, up to, up to so 72 hours. So there's, less. the bills are very, very identical. They, they both try to do the same thing. Um, and that's what needs to be done. So then we can have social services also start uh, trying to get uh, to track who they are so we can make sure that we follow up. Because this is the, the problem with the law as it is today and, and what the, uh, um, the American uh, Psychologists Association were against in the previous bill was it was five days that you would, you would hold them for five days. The problem with an opiate addicted person for five days without treatment after the five days when they're let back out on the street, they'll go back and, and they'll do their same amount that they had done five days ago and die. Uh, so it's very important to try to track um, the individual in a one-time hospital one and then follow through with your lo local social services to, to track that person, get a, uh, you know, a, the, a system where you can have a, 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 somebody that can follow them through and, and help them navigate the second part, which is uh, you know, a, a treatment. So it's a great bill. I can't wait to get them combined, and they'll end, we'll end up, you know, hitting the, the ground in the same, for the same reason. So I think it's got a good chance of, of leaving a committee, and it would be great to have people come on down and, and speak locally. 
next Monday, whatever that is. Yeah, yep. and, and I, yeah, and I, and, and Carol had notified me on this bill as soon as I started, and I went in there. We started looking at them, and, and uh, we had done the research some time ago too uh, on on the previous uh, way to get this through. And, and I would love to have, be able to see it, uh, Bill uh, Carol's bill go through. So uh, I think uh, one more question. Let's go. <laughs> The protective custody statute you're talking about as it was, was that when a person is an imminent threat to themselves or others, police would take him against his or her will to the hospital. And then in that law, it said that within so many hours, a physician could do a 96-hour commitment or whatever. That's not changing. The doctor's going to make the call. Right. So it's not a limit of five days if the doctor oh, feels no, the no, person. No. no. In fact, the language, if the language is hasn't even been really right. constructed yet. Okay. So these are all conceptual right now. So the language will be put to the bill once it gets through the, the public hearing next week. And the details will change by both bills, you know, and they'll come to something that the committee and the ranking members agree will work. So, you know, there's a lot of I you know, to tell the other side of the story, the, the folks that we're getting pushed back from are the ACLU, um, you know, for people's rights, which we knew we would get a pushback from. But, I mean, the, the bill will, will save lives. There is, n beyond a shadow of a doubt, will save lives. So, I mean, it's, it's a good bill. It should get out of committee. Yeah, just, just to clarify what I was talking about, the bill that I was talking about with the five days, came well before Carol put any bills in. This is when we were all notified that they, there was an issue. Uh, um, by our, uh, so then we did research, and the research came back that this was tried before, but the, the time was just too, you, you couldn't get the doctors behind it. Uh, so now by shrinking years that time, yeah. Yeah, years ago, now with these new bills that came out, they're, they're just, um, you know, introducing uh, into the hospital and hopefully getting uh, life coaches uh, uh, to take over on the social services level, which is another uh, argument and issue. Mm -hmm. Is there a time no, so, so the agenda will be put out. It starts at 1030, and my guess is because it's, it's an opioid agenda, you're going to have quite a few people there. It, you, it, it's going to go late. Tom's going to be well, there yeah, late. I could literally go back to Hartford tonight and probably stay for another two yeah. hours on, on our uh, public hearing from 1030 this morning. Had a 14-hour one already, too. So, mm -hmm. so do you guys go it's some a time. Big one. First of all, thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Do you guys have any closing statements? I don't want to... I mean, we'd like to let no, you know if you had anything. Just, thank just, you for all you Thank do. you for having yeah. us. Thank you for I everything you do. I hope Kiner's feeling better because I watched the show two weeks ago, and I guess you were coming out of a hospital. I felt better. Ooh. Yeah. So, Senator Kissel, Representative Hall, Representative Rome, thank you very much for being Thanks here. Thanks for having well, us. Hold on. So, oh. hold on. Tom, this is just because this is nothing personal other than Tom's service on the town council. Oh, you've, you've been here. So, folks, <laughs> if we could gather around. Yay. See, I was going to do this before to throw off your game, but I figured I would wait to the end. Yeah, we can just sit and watch. Yeah, we can Surprise. sit and watch. But no one told me this was happening, so. That's why I didn't want you to, I didn't want to throw off your game. Yeah, that was my Yes, I was really excited. So, on behalf of the, the town council and, of course, town administration and, and the Enfield, the town of Enfield, just a very small token, Tom. Of, our, of your representation over the years for the town of Enfield and the boy education as you moved on to bigger and better things. This is a li nice little beautiful picture that hopefully always reminds you yeah. that, you know, we may disagree on things, we may even argue a little bit, but Enfield certainly is very territorial, as we should be, and we always take care of our own. So, Tom, this is our little token of gratitude from the town of Enfield on your service as the town, town council. All right, thank you. Uh So when you all come up to visit me in my office, um, you'll walk into a little Enfield. Um, I, I, everything Enfield is in my office where this will hang proudly. Uh, um, and uh, so the day I came here, I, I saw that and I said, boy, that's, I love this. So it, this is to me personally um, just, a small, uh, just a small token of all the great things that have happened here and all the great people. So, you know, all the years, all the council people that came through and board of ed and all the service we of everyone that served these years it's uh, you know it's just a great feeling to, to keep serving and and especially serving now on a level where um, there's just so much to do and and so much I, I I can't wait to work with each and every one of you on 
um, in the next couple of years. So we're, we're not over, folks. We're, we're going to serve Enfield together. And, and thank you. Now we have the heat on. It's finally working at. Now, now the winter's over. The heat's on. It's called energy, it's called being efficient, energy efficient. It's, it's warm here. I know. I don't think so. I'm, I'm not. not. I'm dying. I feel good tonight. Jeez. I feel yeah. My feet are. It's a miracle. Like normal. That's good. All right. We'll ride along. All right. So again, thank you, everyone. Yeah, that was a big thing. So moving on, um, item number seven, public communications. Uh, would anyone like to speak for the public? And again, we ask that you please refrain from personalities. The first time up, we'll have five minutes, and then three minutes after that. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Marie. I'm already starting your time. I mean, no excuse. Yeah. Sound it. Probably not. I have a hard time with this mic. Okay, better. Marie Pisner, 25 Roy Street. Tonight I would like to speak about my feelings towards the Enfield Adult Daycare. My mom resided at Mark Twain from 2008 to 2014. And shortly after moving there, she began going to the daycare. My mom did not have dementia or Alzheimer's. She used the daycare more for socialization. I love the fact that she wasn't eating lunch alone and that she was with others communicating. She loved going on their day trips. She loved going on their special events. To myself and my family, the cost was worth it. As time went on, I saw fewer clients attending the daycare. In 2014, my mom began residing at Parkway Pavilion due to her declining health. Shortly after moving there, she asked me if I could take her to a day trip so she could go see all her friends at the daycare. I called them and they said, absolutely, come on down. When we got in there, I was shocked that all those recliners were empty. And when I talked to a few of the, the staff that I'd gotten to know very well, they said that their numbers were down for the simple fact that people are aging in place. Aging in place means having at-home care. For the three years that my mom resided at Parkway, I saw residents doing the same thing. They would come in for rehab and instead of being admitted, they would go home to at-home care. Today's older generation has more options for health care. And studies prove that aging in place is one of the better options. Now, I agree that every, not everyone has these options and that there are still many that rely on adult daycares and long-term facilities. I feel fortunate to say that we also have a Felician adult daycare in our town, and I can speak for them. I worked there when they first opened. Sister Patricia came into my salon that I was closing, and. Let's put it this way, she didn't even barter. She just said, you're putting in a salon and you're going to do hair <laughs> at the daycare. So we did. My husband put the salon in and I did hair there for several years. And so I saw the care that they did receive. And it was wonderful. The bottom line is this. Times are changing. And it's hard for us to grasp change. I get that. But we cannot continue to fund programs that are not providing service to enough residents to make it sustainable. We cannot continue to maintain buildings that are underutilized or not being used at all. I believe that all the council members sitting here tonight are looking at this issue with an open heart. 
And I honestly believe that no one is doing this to hurt our elderly residents or single anyone out. But I have to agree, times are changing. And at this time, I think Enfield Daycare has probably time to change as well. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Who's that? Oh, Bob, sorry, I couldn't see. Bob T. Katz, 815 Woodgate Circle. Marie's right, there's, things are changing at a dramatic pace, and it, it's very difficult for legislatures and council people to keep up with it. Uh, there was a couple comments at the la meeting before. Uh, last meeting I was in the hospital. I uh, changed the 1998 stint to a, a 2019 I upgraded. Uh, you know, you know what's been happening with automobiles? In 1960, the cars were getting 8 miles per gallon. Now they're getting 24. But there's been a big change in what people are buying. It used to be 70 percent sedans and, and 30 percent trucks or SUVs. Now it's 70 percent SUVs. SUVs get less fuel mileage. Uh, this big Santa Fe gets about 20. Uh, Tucson gets 25. The, uh, the Corona gets about 30. Uh, but the real fact is gasoline consumption is at an all-time high. It's been increasing every year. Uh, people are driving more, more miles. It used to be 15,000 miles for a three-year lease. Now people are exceeding that. You know that, Joe. And you have to, you have to pay, to, you have to pay to, for the excess. But the other thing that people at the last meeting says was well, the towns of 45,000. That's not true. 3,500 are in the prison. Now, they did close one of the prisons at 750 less, but the 2010 census showed that we had a 43, 44,000. Uh, it looks like the, probably the next census will be probably, depends on legalization of marijuana. Legalization of marijuana will reduce the prison population because in every state that legalized it, prosecutors have thrown out marijuana convictions. They've released pe people from prisons. Uh, so you may see uh, from 19,000 is 13 and maybe less than 10,000 people in the prisons. And the other thing on addiction, they, they fall under the American Disability Act. Uh, so there's, there's different rules for that. And uh, judges uh, in Massachusetts can put people back in prison, but there's a bill in the Massachusetts legislature to take that power away from the judges so the people can stay out in the streets. Um, the other thing is, Enfield's improving their test scores in, the, in their schools. Uh, the, uh, the third grade scores are, are probably around state average. The high school is about state average, but the middle school is really brings the district way down. We're 147th out of 202 districts. Maybe they'll improve the middle school. Uh, many towns in Massachusetts are closing all their middle schools. They're going through a six-year high school uh, or K through eight. Boston's going to get rid of all their middle schools. Um, the last thing I want to say, there was no sunshine, I guess, in Enfield last week. If you remember the J.I. over the weekend, now I'm going to read this passage because I'm a little disappointed on what's going on in Enfield. find my page here. Uh, the, 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 the J.I. tested the uh, Freedom of Information with 18 municipalities, and Enfield seemed to fail at, at a big, big time, especially the schools. The schools didn't respond, and um, uh, the town did part of, of the request of the town, but the other part, that they couldn't get the information because uh, People were on vacation. They couldn't get the, uh, the, the uh, um, discipline uh, list. And that should, that's public information that should be readily available online, who's being disciplined and for, for what. But apparently some of these records are hidden and they don't want to release them to the public. But that's part that's required by law. And I, w I would like to have the town manager comment on this because 
in my estimation, on looking at all the towns, I know that the, uh, the mayor of uh, Andover didn't want to comply, and he said you can stick that uh, request where the sun doesn't shine. But about four days later, he must have talked to the town attorney, but he released all the information they requested. So apparently we have a cu couple of departments that don't want to release the, the information on what's going on. Thank you. I'll be back. Thank you, Bob. And I, I would request town manager to, re to respond on that. Anyone else like to speak for the council? John? Uh, John, <clears throat> excuse me, John Ungeyer, 271 Abbey Road, Enfield, Connecticut. So uh, several weeks ago, I sat here and spoke in opposition to the, uh, uh, the, the establishment of tolls in the state of Connecticut and in support of a non-binding resolution before the town council. And uh, later that evening, the town council um, voted in favor of, of the resolution. And so today I, I sit here before you again to uh, commend the town council for passing uh, that non-binding <clears throat> non resolution. And uh, better than commending, I'm also uh, applauding the town council for the leadership and the strength that you exhibited in standing up uh, for the non-binding resolution. It was an example uh, for other towns here in the, uh, um, in the state. So there were other towns um, that passed uh, non-binding resolutions uh, in opposition to the tolls, like East Windsor, Sherman, Stamford, Trumbull, New Britain and now Suffield and others are pending and they've used the Enfield uh, resolution as a template uh, for their non-binding resolutions also to go on record uh, to do that. So um, that non-binding resolution is just one example that I'm aware of of the many things that the, that the town council is doing for our good town of, of Enfield. Um, I, have a, I have a list of some 50 different items that, the, that, that you're involved with and that you're working on and, and working to make Enfield um, a better place. And it's, uh, it's amazing of uh, all, all the things that you're doing. And uh, many people are not, uh, not aware, aware of that. Um, I was reminded today of a little tagline that I, that I kind of created uh, for, for Enfield, which was basically it said, it said um, Enfield. It just keeps getting better. And that's, that's what I see happening. Enfield is getting better. Uh, the wheels may not be spinning as quickly as we, we want them to, but we're moving in the right direction. And so um, Mayor Mike Ludwig, um, I know that you're a driving force behind uh, a lot of that. And so. Um, I, I just want to, rec I want to recognize that and go on in public record recognizing the, the, the good work that you're doing and the leadership that you're exhibiting, you and the town council and, and the entire team. And I know that many of these decisions are very difficult and they're, and they're tough, but I'm comforted to know that these tough decisions are in good hands. So thank you. John. John O'Blink, 12 Home on Drive. Uh, John, don't stole my thunder a little bit. Both Johns are going to be talking again in opposition against the tolls. Um, I think uh, with the resolution that was passed uh, with the town of Enfield uh, a few couple weeks back, and not only that, but the Republican Town Committee uh, was at a home show. Uh, if anybody didn't know, uh, last weekend or weekend before, um, and did a survey there that said, that asked people, are you for the tolls or against the tolls or no opinion? And just to throw out the numbers again, 182 said they were against the tolls, 9 said they were for, and 11 had no, no opinion. Um, and those were people not only from Enfield, but all of this region of Connecticut. And I think that 
that speaks uh, pretty well on how people, at least in this area in Connecticut, feel about the tolls. Um, the numbers, I don't think there's any argument to be made there. Um, so again, uh, it was brought up tonight. Uh, John brought it up behind me, and I'm going to bring it up again. Uh, the tolls are not a not a viable option, at least for this part of Connecticut. So, and uh, again, uh, Joey Bosco, congratulations on Friday night. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Mr. Neville. Welcome, Thank sir. Thank you. I'm Tim Neville, 25 Jewel Street, Enfield, and speaking as a citizen, but also as a uh, longtime member of the Suicide Prevention Committee. And I'm here to speak really about the memorandum of understanding that Gene brought, uh, brought up to you folks, and I think you have that paperwork. And also, I think you have an item on the agenda. I think it's 14I, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm speaking, uh, urging you folks to pass that resolution. Uh, and um, and it, I think it celebrates the good, good work about. and the collaboration that we have in Enfield. I mean, as a lot of you know, you probably know through Rachel's challenge and all the other things that go on here, that have, have been tied into the suicide prevention. But that committee started eight years ago out of a tragedy, of several tragedies, several suicides that came up. And Scott Cope and myself and Jean were all in there saying, how do we, how do we address this? Instead of pointing fingers as people were doing back then and we had no real solutions for it, out of that work and the collaboration between the town and the school system, and our spirit of collaboration is really growing. If, you know, a demonstration of that was earlier this evening when we all got together to solve a common problem. Um, so I'd like to uh, support that resolution, urge you guys to do that. What came out of that was, you know, as we got into doing prevention, postvention, and so on, and educating everybody in town and, and training all of our employees, we started to evolve as a committee into other areas. You start getting, you start talking about suicide, you start talking about drug abuse, you start talking about opioid use, you start talking about other forms of mental health, you start going down lower and so, and, and so on. So we started to come up with other, we set up other committees and we're saying, this is crazy. Why don't we put this all together? We have a working committee that's gone for eight years. Uh, Jean is a, a, a wizard at getting grants. I, I, she's a, a commender, I've worked with her for way over t a decade in, in doing this, and she has brought that and, and developed that collaborative spirit between us. And so I urge you folks, if you will, to uh, support that resolution. It ties together all the work that we've done. We're dissolving one committee and creating something else because we see that it meets the needs of the community better. And it's easier to support one committee that's more inclusive than it is to support three committees to do it. We're sharing the same thing. So I ask you to support it, and I know it's going to come up a little bit later on, but um, we'd, we'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Tom. Yeah. You think you would? Now, now you only have five minutes. <laughs> Not enough when it comes to Enfield. So Tom Arnone, Five Cardi Road. Uh, just wanted to actually uh, mirror what uh, Tim just said. I uh, hope that you'll uh, look favorably on the MOU uh, to continue this, uh, you know, great effort uh, that started with uh, Scott Copen a number of years ago and now branching out into more mental health, more wellness, uh, town wellness. And uh, I think it's uh, going to be a great future uh, uh, collaborative experience for this town because we're already known to be a leader in this area. So, and this will take us to the next uh, next century. So th I hope you can uh, support that and thank you very much for everything tonight. And uh, that's enough. Thank you, sir. Anyone else like to speak for the council for the first time? Lucian. Lucian Lefebvre, 54 Kimberly Drive. Uh, most of you know, I, I come here quite often to attend these meetings, uh, and I normally come here to talk about veterans' issues. That's not the issue tonight. In the recent past, I think things have kind of gotten out of hand at some of these meetings, and it's gotten nasty and downright ugly at times. I served 37 years in the military to defend people's right to disagree with government, with each other, but to do it in a civil manner. What, what's happened in the past, I, I know the council sits behind closed doors and has much more information uh, 
to gather to make the decisions that you make. And I know you grit your teeth a lot of times when you make those decisions. They're tough decisions. And I believe you come out with a decision that's best for the town of Enfield overall. And I think you work together as a council. You hang your R's and your D's at the door, go in and hash it out, and come out with the best solution you can. The, the people that complain about it, my advice to them, if they don't like what's sitting in front of you here, run for office. The only thing I'm going to tell them is, when you do it, be aware, this whole bench in front of me is sitting here at no pay. They do it for the town of Enfield. And, you know, be careful what you wish for. And that's it. Like I said, I, I just, I've been biting my tongue and being quiet, but I had to say something. So, thank you. Thank you, Lucian. Appreciate it. Anyone else like to speak for the council? For the first time? For the second time? Bob? Bob T. Katz, Woodgate Circle. <clears throat> you know, I, I served on the school board. I always wondered how, how things started. You know, history, hi, history research is very interesting because you find out the answer of one question, you end up with 10 more questions. Uh, the, the, the proposal to regionalize the school districts is probably a bad deal because they want to use the probate uh, territories, but the probate territories will break up the present regional school districts. We have uh, 19 regional school districts. They work together. Originally, that was done to put a regional high school, but it morphed into uh, one superintendent for about five towns or two towns, whatever it is. For an example, uh, Reading and Easton will be broken up. The regional school district will be broken up. Uh, it'd be two probate dif different districts. Uh, it, it's unbelievable. That'd be, and, and today I was confronted by a fireman from another town, and he says, why doesn't Enfield have one fire department? This is an age-old question that we heard over and over again. And I said, it's almost impossible to do that. Do you think the four, four districts are going to vote for have higher taxes? And it's, it takes a three-quarter vote, like a constitutional amendment. Uh, I said, there's 311 fire departments in Connecticut, and there's, a, there's, a hundred, there's over 100, uh, about 150, well, there's 202 school districts. So I said, that's never going to happen. He says, well. Enfield's got more fire apparatus than Hartford. Well, I'm going to look into that because I've heard this for the last 30 years, and I don't believe it because Hartford's only about 18 square miles and we're 35 square miles. I don't, I don't believe Hart Enfield's got more equipment than Hartford, but I'm going to check that out and because I want to end that age-old uh, comment that people keep making. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Anyone else like to speak for the council? Hearing none, I declare public communications closed. Moving on to item, sorry, Paul Jones. Item number eight, council communications. Anyone have any communications? Deputy Mayor Suzak. Make a motion to suspend the rules and move items E, F, G, H, I, J, and K to miscellaneous and proceed to vote. Motion to suspend the rules by Deputy Mayor Suzak. Do I have a second? Second. By second. Councilor Davis. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none by show of hands. All those in favor? Opposed? We have 10 in favor, zero against. Anyone else have any councilor communications? Hearing none, moving on to town manager report, item number nine. Good evening. Um, we this month uh, file, or for the second meeting of the month, file the PAR report. Uh, a lot of good and useful information in it as usual, so if there are any questions, I any can Any questions entertain. for the town manager on the PAR, or any questions in general? And then in response, normally it's, yep. it's appropriate for me. I can yes. respond to Bob. I've been answering Bob's questions. This is the 30th year. Uh, the first time, first meeting as town attorney theater years ago, he asked me a question. Um, I didn't have the answer then. 
so I had to wait and come back at the next meeting. But in regard to the Freedom of Information um, that he referenced in the JI, what I can tell you is uh, we give every month, and the HR director is here to verify that. The JI asks for all of our discipline. He is the repository for the whole town. He sends out an email to all of our departments, and he garners all that information, and then he, he gives it out. Some months, luckily, there isn't any. So in regard to the Public Works, that I have to look into. We don't do it department by department. We go through HR because that's where they keep the discipline records so we can see if there was some miscommunication. I will point out in that article, however, there was a, another a part of it that commended Enfield by the JI for going above and beyond and producing information that wasn't required under the FOI and creating a list uh, of the information that they requested. So I think that's appropriate. And as this council knows, um, we go above and beyond with freedom of information. We take it very seriously, the letter and the spirit of the law. We do a lot of training of the council, of our departments. We bring in the FOI spokesman. We've opened it up to the public. We've brought in the Board of Education and others. And I think we have a very good record with the FOI. And I think uh, we respond very well and as quickly as we can um, to all requests from persons. And in particular, we get a lot from the JI. And I think we have a very good rapport and relationship with them and a very good track record in response responding to the FOI. But in that particular one uh, for the DPW, they probably, because they, they don't normally do it, perhaps it was, I think the article said the person was on vacation, but they're not the ones that give that information out. So we'll look at it going forward so there is no misunderstanding. Any questions for Chris? Thank you, sir. Moving on to item 10, Town Attorney Report. Maria. Good evening, everyone. There's no formal report. Any questions for the Town Attorney? You're off the hook. Hearing none. Item number 11 reports to special committees. Councillor Muller. I have a quick update for JFK. I'd first like to start off by thanking the entire building committee for giving up a Saturday for interviews. We interviewed four firms this past Saturday JCJ, Tecton, Moser Pylon, and Antonazzi. The firms were graded, and JG, JCJ was the top firm. Thank you. Thank you. Any other reports to special committees? Councillor Ungar. I just wanted to remind some of our seniors in town that the Enfield Commission on Aging, they offer the Enfield Senior Minor Repair Program, and that's going to be starting up on Tuesday, April 2nd, 2019. Um, the Council on Aging wants our seniors to be comfortable in their own homes, and some tasks might be a little too challenging for them to tackle. So you can call uh, this group here, and they'll come and uh, fix a leaky faucet. They'll put an air conditioner in a window for you. Um, if people would like more information, they can call 860-253-6396 or send an email to coa at enfield.org. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Suzak. And this week, the facilities will be doing interviews on Tuesday and Wednesday for the master plan and development for the town buildings. Anyone else? Okay, moving on. Item 12, old business, we have none. Items A, 1 and 2 on page 1. Moving on to page 2, items 3 through 15, we have no appointments. Moving on to page 3, at the top, items 16 through 18, we have no appointments. Item B, appointments from the town manager, items 1 through 11, there are none on page 3. On top of page 4, our town manager, items 12 through 14, none. Item C, appointments for PNZ commission appointed, council approved, we have none. Item D, remain, the non-union pay remains tabled. Item E, nut, nutmeg solar remains tabled. Uh, at, uh, item F, school roof replacements remain tabled. We move on to item 13, new business. There is no consent agenda on item A. Again, item B, no appointments from the town council. Item C, no appointments from the town manager. Item D, no council approved com P and Z commissions appointments. Item E, do we have a motion to remove from the table? It's not tabled. Oh, it's new, I'm sorry, it's new business. Discussion resolution to approve a four-year collective bargaining agreement with Ashmead number four, local 1029. Is there a formal resolution? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, sorry, we get that. Sorry, Chris, I don't know if you want to, I'll look for the resolution if you want to. Um, actually, we have Steve Belinda, the Steve, HR director here. Sorry. 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 Oh, there it is, yeah. Welcome, Steve. Good evening. <laughs> Well, after almost oh, a year and a half of long, arduous negotiations, I am proud and happy to present to you a contract that can be hopefully adopted tonight. 
Um, this took a lot of work, a lot of collaboration, a lot of um, back and forth, and a lot of co uh, cooperation. And one piece of evidence why there was a lot of cooperation is that after new proposals were over, uh, the first three sessions, we were able to still come back with even new proposals, keep an open mind, and work together. We needed some things from the union. The union needed some things from us, and we kept hashing it out, keep grinding away, because we knew that um, this was better than the alternative, which was arbitration. I am proud to say that you're going to get some things tonight that you would never have gotten in arbitration. You only got it through negotiation. And that comes from the result of having a good, strong wor working relationship with this union. Uh, for example, we got the last group of employees now into the HSA program, the Health Savings Account uh, Program. That's about 146 employees. That will produce savings. It's already proven itself with the other six unions. Uh, we got the schedule that you guys needed. Um, that took a lot of back and forth, a lot of proposals that got shot down, but we kept hammering away. We didn't give up. Um, and now you have a group of employees that will be working Monday through Saturday, 10 hours a day, with no overtime. That speaks volumes. You got the 0% for 2017. Uh, and you also got the lead civilian dispatcher after meeting with the first responders, the chief, fire chiefs, the town, uh, the police chief. Um, we all came together and said, you know what, we need lead dispatchers today. That's something that came in after first proposals were um, produced. And they said, yes, let's work together. And the union needed some things too. They needed some insurance coverage for their custodians that they were the only group of employees that didn't have it for the entire town. And they also needed to uh, increase the uh, pay rates for the dispatchers. And at, when they first came on board with that, I'm like, wow, you guys are crazy. But then I saw the numbers, and then I'm the one shouting from the highest mountaintop saying, yes, we need to increase the pay rates for these dispatchers because I can't even attract people to want to work here. In fact, I just learned the other week that a dispatcher we hired that was in orientation said, wow, um, I'm still in the... Uh, uh, I'm still being pursued by East Hartford, but now that I know this contract is being proposed and what's coming there, I'm going to withdraw my name now. That's how tight this market is for dispatchers. And these dispatchers are not easy to find because it's a highly stressful job. They have to learn how to um, process information fast under stress, and they have to get trained and certified by the state uh, certification boards to do their job. Not easy. And there's a lot of cannibalization going on within our municipalities. It kills me for people to want to come learn here and earn somewhere else. That's a poor business model. So I'm happy to say that with this contract, if you do vote affirmative tonight, we can now keep some of the employees that we've been training. Um, having said that, um, those are some of the highlights. So there's other language that we both sides needed that we got, uh, operational things. But for the most part, though, this is uh, a good contract, and I strongly urge you guys to adopt it tonight. Thank you, sir. Any questions for Steve from members of the council? Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say, Steve, again, you know, again, how important it was to get to get a zero. Again, I, I, I congratulate the union because, again, we asked last year as a council and we got cut $10 million that we needed everyone to, to buy in, and they did. So, again, congratulations to the union and to you for negotiating it because, again, it's important, again, that everyone pitched in when we went through a and we still may go through more difficult times, but at least we were able to make it through with everyone p pitching in the hand, so they need to be commended. And again, thank you. Thank you. A sense of humor goes a long way in negotiations, right. too, because right. <laughs> you need it. Well, and I, and I just think, you know, that you know, it joins the teachers who gave us a zero uh, a little over a year ago, and they did as well. So our unions are a partner so far mm -hmm. with the town and the schools. So and and they're job. aware of that, too. Yep. A lot of them live in town, so yep. they, they feel it. Again. So uh, we, I got to read the yeah I'm going to read the resolution then I think we have an amendment on it because there's I think there's a clarification. Yeah. So we resolve to approve four-year collective bargaining agreement with Ashby Number Four, Local Number 1029, Public Works Dispatchers Custodians Library. Resolve that the Enfield Town Council does hereby approve the three-year collective bargaining agreement between the Town of Enfield and the Enfield and excuse me the American Federation State County Municipal Employees Union Council Number Four, Local Number 1029, Union dated July 1, 2017 through June 30, 2020, prepared on February 20, 2019, by Steve Belinda, the Director of Human Resources. Do I have a motion to approve? So by Deputy Mayor Suzak, seconded by Councillor uh, Denny. Sorry, Councillor Denny. So the question before... Motion to amend, So with, that should be a, in the language of a four-year contract, correct? Correct. Yep. 2021. 
And so, and it also should be, should be January, excuse me, July 1, 2017 through June 30th, 2021. Correct. So I want to make sure when we just do this correctly, I make a, a motion to amend the language. In the first sentence, town council does hereby approve a four-year collective bargaining agreement. And then last sentence, union dated July 1st, 2017 through June 30th, 2021. So moved. Seconded by Councilor Mullis. Motion by Councilor Mullis, seconded by Deputy Mayor Suzak. We, we go down the language. Anything else? I'd have to say Steve does a better job negotiating than writing the <laughs> resolutions. <laughs> Any questions on the amendment? All those in favor of the amendment by a show of hands. Opposed? We have 11 in favor, zero against for the amendment. Now, any questions on the main motion as amended? Hearing none, roll call, please. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Four. Councilor Ungeyer. Four. Councilor Bosco. Four. Councilor Sakala. Four. Councilor Crisati. Four. Councilor Davis. Four. Councilor Denny. Four. Councilor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Suraza. Four. There's 11 in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Thank you, sir. Appreciate right. it. Thank you. Thank you. Item 14, item, moving on to item 14, items for discussion. Item A, there is no consent agenda. Item B, there is no town council appointments. Item C, there's no town manager appointments. Item D, there is no council approved P&Z appointments. Items E, F, G, H, I, J, K have been moved to miscellaneous. Moving on to item 15, miscellaneous. Item E, discussion resolution authorizing the town manager to enter into contract with the Connecticut Department of Housing Small Cities Community Development Block Grant Program. Anyone want to waive the reading or I will pound away? Is there a motion to waive the reading by Deputy yes. Mayor, by yes. Councilor Sakala, seconded by Councilor Davis? All those in favor of uh, waiving the reading? We got 11 in favor, zero against. 10 in favor, one against. Uh, so if Chris will defer to you and. Yes, yeah, so we have, uh, this is basically the. Um, you were testing me before, trying to confuse me between the two grants, right. but I was correct. This grant is in regard to the homeless grant of over $300,000 that we received that Dawn was so instrumental in obtaining for us. Damien is here for any questions, but basically we have received the money, and this is the authorization for me, the con for, for me to sign the contract and get the funding so they can expend it. Welcome, Dan. Just a little brief. I know it's been a while, so maybe just refresh everyone in public what this is for. Sure. I think it's a great this is on? Right? It is. Good evening. My name is Damian Humphrey. I'm a uh, Deputy Director of Social Services for the Town of Enfield. And this grant is for $310,000, uh, $222 uh, for a mobile homeless shelter diversion in the region. So it's not only for the Town of Enfield, but it's also for our seven surrounding towns. And this uh, money will be used to uh, work with community partners, uh, CHR, to be able to provide uh, diversionary services uh, for folks who are about to become homeless or in danger of becoming homeless in the region. Any questions for Damien from any members of the council? Again, this is a great grant, and again, trying to actually be proactive to prevent is just, in my opinion, the right way to do it. So congratulations to you and your staff on this. Thank you. Motion to uh, roll call, please. Need to move the resolution. Oh, sorry. Um, waiving the motion to approve the resolution that, uh, the resolution resolution. that was waived to read. By Deputy Mayor Suzak. Second. Seconded by Councilor Crisati. All those in favor? No, excuse me. Any discussion on the resolution? Sorry. Yeah, I, we just waved the reading. Any discussion on the resolution? Like See, I'm used to reading. I apologize, Suzanne. Thank good catch. Roll call, Actually, please. It's Jeanette. Yeah, roll call. Deputy Mayor Suzanne. Four. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Crisati. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Councillor Kiner is out. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. Councillor Sferraza. Four. There's 10 in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Moving on to item F in miscellaneous. Resolution authorizing the town manager to, decide to, to sign the school readiness grant application, whereas the Office of Early Childhood has released a request for a proposal for the fiscal year 2020 
for the school readiness grant and the quality enhancement grant, which both require signatures by the town manager and the superintendent of schools. And whereas Kite, serving as Enfield School Readiness Council, is in the process of releasing grant applications to eligible early, early, care, and early care and education providers for funds that will be available for the town in fiscal year 2020. Resolve that the town manager, Christopher W. Bronson, is authorized to sign and submit the grant applications in the name and on behalf of the town of Enfield with the Connecticut Office of Early Childhood Development, submitted on March 18, 2019, by Don Homer Boothier, Director of Social Services. So by second. Councillor Muller, seconded by Councillor Crisati. I believe Gene can answer any specific questions, but basically this is for uh, $249,872. It's 28 preschool spots plus some money for training and development and an additional 12,000 for coordinating and uh, evaluating the program. We've done it before and this is authorizing me to apply for it. You, got, you guys sat patiently, you're welcome. If you'd like to say anything, I'll leave it up to you guys. No, you're good? Any Anyone have any questions? No. no. Okay. Thank you. Okay, you, you like oh, you, <laughs> I know, sorry. I want to make sure you had a chance to speak even sitting here. Hearing none, roll call please. Deputy Mayor Suzette. Four. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Crisati. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Councillor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. Councillor Sferrazza. Four. There's 11 in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Under miscellaneous item G, resolution authorizing the town manager to sign grant applications, enter into contract, and accept funds from the Connecticut Department of Transportation. Whereas the State of Connecticut Department of Transportation, other known, known as DOT, provides several grants to the Enfield Department of Social Services. And whereas the Enfield Department of Social Services is in the process of submitting two grant applications to the State DOT for funds that will be available for the town in fiscal year 2020, resolve that Town Manager Christopher W. Bromson is, author, one, authorized to sign and submit the grant applications to the State of Connecticut DOT in the name and on behalf of the Town of Enfield, and two, enter into a contract with a state Connecticut DOT subject to review and approval by the town attorney and three is authorized to accept funds if awarded submitted on March 18, 2019 by Don Homer Boothier, Director of Social Services. By Councillor Muller, seconded by Councillor Denny. Um, again, Damien is here if there are any specific questions. This is to apply for a new one dial ri a ride bus, also for operational costs for the magic carpet. And this one's a triple play. They'll have, they're, they're authorizing for, me, for you to apply, for me to sign it, and actually then accept the funds in one resolution. Councilor Denny. That question has come up, uh, came to my attention, <clears throat> especially with the schools. Uh, and I, it doesn't have much to do with this grant because it's a great idea, but can we look at or someone, Bob and I specifically probably, would like to sit down with you and discuss some of the route or if we can change some of the route changes. For example, <clears throat> there are parents who were providing, we have to get taxi cab rides for to get to the schools when they need to go to the school department for a meeting or something. Mm -hmm. There is no stops in North Thompsonville from Brainerd Road North at all. Mm -hmm. It's just a collective, you know, and, and I'm a, in District 4. But there's other areas in town and not just District 4 that in order for anyone in my district to get to the bus, they have to go to Washington Road. And, and it's very de detrimental for somebody's parents who don't have vehicles that are living in housing or whatever the case mm -hmm. may be, and they can't get it. And it came to Bob's and my attention just recently. So I'd like to see if we can either expand or put it, we're, we're, I guess we're getting another bus, correct? Well, actually, the bus is for dial -a ride oh, okay. which is for and senior programs. And some of them programs. don't apply for dial -a ride uh, you know, uh, qualify for dial -a ride So. Mm -hmm are uh, two routes, magic carpet routes, the blue line and the yellow line. Uh, we are restricted in terms of the, uh, the route has to be within an hour uh, from point A to point A. But uh, we would certainly welcome your input. Uh, our program manager, Annette Orlandi, she is actually looking uh, to be able to see if we can um, uh, reroute some of our uh, lines to better serve the community. And actually, she actually went out today uh, 
to look at uh, some of our current routes. So uh, any input and all input okay. is welcome. There you go. Well, what we'll do is we'll set it up at the appropriate subcommittee and we can bring staff and invite yeah. uh, the counselors and that would be a good venue to discuss it and, and see what we can come up with. Perfect. Okay. Very Thank good. You. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dan. So, Councilor Sarraza, I'm sorry, Ed, you're all set. Yeah, I'm okay. yeah. Councilor Sarraza. I, I just had one quick question. <laughs> sorry, Dan, you got more questions. It's okay. Sorry. Um, the Magic Carpet Bus, you track riders, obviously, right? Monthly, quarterly, however you do it. Monthly. Monthly. Do you have, are those on the website somewhere or those numbers are available, what the ridership is? Actually, the uh, numbers are available in the monthly PARs. So in the PAR uh, documents that uh, are in these minutes uh, are uh, numbers for the month of February uh, are there, both for Dollaride and Mar Magic, Magic Carpet. Okay, so year to year comparisons? That's a very good question. We can get that information for you if you would like to know I, I would. the last two, three years. Yeah. Um, and actually, we're uh, in the process of really modernizing uh, how to track our bus routes, our ridership, get a better understanding of who is using Magic Carpet, uh, what times, uh, so that we can uh, create more um, um, efficient bus lines yeah I, specifically year to year i'd like to see so through the mayor to the uh mr bromson if you could get we will get that information and share with the entire okay. council thank you sure you're welcome so damien state sorry stater carl mm -hmm. you all set you're trying to run all the time Dan. <laughs> yeah, you're, <laughs> councilor bosco sure so if i'm reading this right the magic carpet bus is being held up by the um Oh my God! The dial a ride, so that you, they're on the same bid this year. So if you vote no for the Magic Carpet Bus, you're voting no on the dial a ride. Actually, we just received two Magic Carpet Buses uh, this year. Um, we are applying for one dial a ride bus uh, to replace some of our uh, older fleet, uh, but the funding for Magic Carpet is for operational costs. Right, this one is one bus and operational costs for Magic Carpet. So it's not two buses, it's one bus and then operational costs for the Magic Carpet program. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Sure. Yes, this has been long, even when Pam started it, when they did the red line and the blue line, I always requested that, um, it's District 1, Joey, I'm looking out for you that it go to the Stowe area because of course. that has really, for me, always been something that needs to happen. A lot of the other ones do go past some of the schools like the Whitney and the, mm -hmm. the old annex and things like that. But I really, you know, when you do, we do look at it. Give me a call because I really trying to get that for a while. Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Roll call, please. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Four. <laughs> Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Councillor Bosco. Against. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Crisati. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Councillor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. Councillor Terraza. Four. There's 10 in favor, one against, and no abstentions. Under miscellaneous item H, resolution authorizing the town manager into an agreement for architectural and engineering service for additions and renovation services for the JFK, John F. Kennedy Middle School. Whereas the JFK Middle School Renovation Building Committee, also known as the committee, as charged by the Town Anfield Town Council, has completed its review process for architectural and engineering services for additions and renovations to the JFK Middle School, and whereas the committee has recommended JCJ architecture. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Enfield Town Council hereby accepts the recommendation of the committee, and be it further resolved that the council hereby authorizes the town manager to enter in, into and amend the agreement for architectural and engineering service for the JFK Middle School renovation project, which agreement and any amendments there thereto are subject to review and approval of the town attorney. It's submitted on February 27, 2019, by the town manager's office. So by Councilor Muller, second by Councilor Crisati. So I, I don't know if any, just real brief, or I don't know, I think most people know. Any questions for the manager? 
Oh, I just want to thank the committee again for taking their personal time on a Saturday after all mode day long to actually recommend a, to interview and recommend architecture. I mean, architecture firms. And that's all they talk about their volunteers, and they volunteered their time. So, uh, great job, everyone. There's a few members out in the, yeah. out in the crowd. Yeah. Thank you. Good job. Hearing none, roll call, please. Deputy Mayor Suzette. Four. Councillor Ungar. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Crisati. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Councillor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. Councillor Sferrazzo. Four. There's 11 in favor and against, no abstentions. Well done. Miscellaneous item I, resolution establishing a youth mental health wellness advisory council. Whereas the town and the Enfield Public Schools are committed to promoting the health and wellness of Enfield's children and youth from birth age through the age of 21, and whereas the town and the Enfield Public Schools have demonstrated a successful working partnership in the community in the schools serving Enfield families, and whereas the Suicide Prevention Task Force members have determined a broader scope of work is needed to better meet the challenging needs in the Enfield community, and whereas the Suicide Prevention Task Force will dis will be disbanded effective June 30th, 2019, and whereas the town through the Division of Youth and Family Services and the Enfield Public Schools have agreed to establish and sustain the Youth Mental Health and Wellness Advisory Council to build upon and expand the work of the Suicide Prevention Task Force. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Enfield Town Council, by the Enfield Town Council, that the Youth Mental Health and Wellness Advisory Council shall be established effective July 1, 2019, submitted on March 8, 2019, by Don Homer Boothier, Director of Social Services. Oh, by Councillor Second. Denny, seconded by Deputy Mayor Suzak. Jean Hoy is Jean, here. Would you like if you to have any questions, she mentioned around, this. Feel free if you want to come up. She any mentioned this in her or? early remarks, so yeah. perhaps she could expand a little bit on it. Anything you want to highlight about, again, some of the thought process that brought you guys to make, make this change? Yes, so when we started on. Thank you. When we first started the Suicide Prevention Steering Committee, we focused on like four areas. It was school climate and youth involvement, which we chose Rachel's Challenge. We did crisis response, so we understood post prevention. So now we, we created a brochure with our police department so that when there was a death by suicide, we would give it the families a brochure about sometimes at, at the scene, if there was a suicide, it was a crime scene, so families wouldn't have a place to stay that night, that we would offer them counseling services. We engaged our uh, funeral homes and our faith communities so that there would be funding for families if they needed a place to stay. Our um, funeral homes were trained in trauma to help reduce the stigmatism that it's really okay to say that my child died by suicide. And it, it would open up uh, an avenue that we could reach out to them and talk to them about the, the trauma that just occurred in their family. Um, we were very committed to training and resources. Year one, we absolutely had no clue what to do. So we, we were like committed to really learning uh, evidence-based practices and really um, effective strategies that would address our community in terms of how to reduce um, and prevent any further youth death by suicide. Uh, and since then, we've uh, really gained momentum. Our department was charged with maintaining all of the subcommittees to making sure they met, that we tracked our successes, that we tracked with agendas and minutes and purpose and function, and we just expanded to um, going after state and federal grants, the suicide prevention grant we have now, we have the drug-free communities grant now, the Stop Act grant, and it's like we now need to bring it under one umbrella so that we can manage it more effectively and we're starting to really braid a lot of the funding so it gets kind of confusing if we're kind of doing a strategy of training and resource or capacity building, we're pulling from different funds, but again, it'll just bring it into one advisory committee and for sustainability, we, it was designed that there would be key sectors. So as some of us age out or retire or leave our positions, the work stays committed with this advisory committee with superintendent, town council, uh, director of youth services, uh, pupil services, nurse supervisor, pediatrician. So again, we have a well-rounded steering committee that can bring different lens to all this work because again, it's multifaceted and we have to work together and I am so, pleased to, to know that the collaboration from everyone in town, you guys have been amazing from the police department to the school department to town officials to our youth serving agencies, like we're there, we're tracking data on number of EMS runs, sort of 
protective custodies, number of behavioral incidences at school. So all of these things, as we start to seeing trends, we know that this is where we need to focus our energies in finding funding to support this. So it's been a wonderful committee. I'm just honored to be a part of it. Um, and I'm just really compassionate about taking care of our young children. You have the Commission on Aging. We need a similar process that, that supports the health and wellness of our kids. So thank you for your well consideration. Done. Well done. Any questions or comments? No, I, I agree. I think it's great that, A, you would be thinking of being a little more efficient to provide a better service. I mean, that's just what it's all about, providing great, and I hate to use the word customer service, it's but that's really what it is. It is. Yeah. That's it. And, and, you, and again, I think it's great that you're willing to, as a community, that we're challenged, we're going after this. This is, this is great. So, so again, you. I think this, uh, I commend you for, again, thinking a little bit, hey, change it a little bit, consolidate it, and we're going to provide a better service, which obviously is to our kids. So again, well, well done. Thank you. Roll call, please. Thank you, Jean. Deputy Mayor Suzette. Four. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Satala is out. Councillor Grisotti. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Councillor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. Councillor Serraza. Four. There's ten in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Move on to item J, resolution to charge fees for notary services. Resolve the Enfield Town Council pursuant with Chapter 3, Section 5 of the Enfield Town Charter, hereby adopts a fee of $5 for notarization services performed by town departments. Submitted on March 12, 2019 by the Director of Finance. By Councillor Muller, seconded by Councillor Crisati. Um, Briefly, um, we had charged staff with trying to come up with, and we still are, looking at other uh, areas to um, increase or enhance revenues where appropriate. Uh, Susanna Lechney should be given the total credit for this idea. Uh, she had looked at her within her own department. We then expanded and asked the library and the building department and realized that, you know, this takes a good amount of staff time. Other municipalities charge for it. This is a, a reasonable uh, rate. We also have to keep our people certified and the costs associated with that. So this is a, a small price, but, and as we said, it's probably going to be a, a, not a, um, large but a modest revenue to the town but it could in fact end up being in the you know range of tens of thousands of dollars so i think it's appropriate i thank suzanne for looking at this and coming up with it and i endorse it to the council uh, and hope that you will pass it any questions roll call please deputy mayor suzak four councillor on four councillor bosco four councillor sakala four Councillor Crisotti. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Councillor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. Councillor Sferraza. Four. There's 11 in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Uh, item K under miscellaneous resolution amending facility uses pol usage policy for all town and board of education owned and controlled facilities. Whereas in 2018, a committee comprised of the town council, the board of education, and staff of both organizations met over a series of months to create a workable policy for the use of town and, BO and board of ed BOE owned and controlled facilities, which, po which policy was adopted by council resolution number 9942 on July 7, 2008, and by the board of ed on July 8, 2008, and whereas through, through there were minor revisions in 2011. Since then, it has become apparent that such policy required careful review to ensure proper and consistent usage of such facilities and provide compensation for expenses incurred to maintain and operate them. And whereas the Enfield Town Council wishes to, to presently revise this policy, now therefore be resolved the Enfield Town Council does hereby, hereby adopt the facilities use policy in accordance with the attached revisions submitted by the town manager's office on March 14, 2019. Deputy Mayor Suzak, seconded by Councilor Crisati. Uh, I'm going to ask Mark to come up, um, Mark Garr, who... I, I do have a question on this. Yeah, we're bringing up Mark. Yep, okay, yep. Sure. you don't worry. Um, this, this, again, came to our attention. We thought it merited review um, because, as the resolution indicates, this is for the... It's a bifurcated policy by the town and the Board of Ed for facilities, buildings, and fields. 
a rate structure was never adopted for the fields. And in fact, we're striking out, if you so choose, the word nonprofit, because right now, the use of field by many of the users is prohibited by this ordinance. So you could either leave it that way, and we will preclude any of those teams or tournaments or outside persons from using the fields, or you can adopt this, and then there is a rate structure. What we did is, this covers softball, baseball, and soccer. We wanted to make it simple. We looked at all the area towns to see what they were charging. Uh, and also, in addition to just all, and Mark has done, we have a list of all of our fields and where they are, uh, plus the high school and the annex, which are the turf, uh, artificial turf. So we realized that we were not charging for the use of any of these fields. Most all other communities do, or they prohibit their use by anyone but the town. So to make it simple, what we've put before you for your consideration is we've listed and enumerated what I want to call bona fide, genuine town teams, our school teams, and then teams that are comprised of all Enfield residents going back 30 years. Mark, who deals with these teams, knows who's who. So in the section of exemption, we've listed those. They will not be affected by this rate structure. Those who wish to use our fields um, for the aforementioned uses of soccer, baseball, and uh, softball during the season, our fields are taking a beating. They're being used, I'm not going to say 24-7, but you know, you get the, the, the riff. They really are. They're being uh, heavily used. We spend quite a bit of money on them. And they're being used by outside teams, some of whom uh, are tournaments, some of whom uh, are for-profit uh, leagues. And they charge their people to be part of it. And we're really one of the few towns that doesn't recoup some of that money. So what we've done is we've made a proposed structure. We went before the subcommittee. Um, they had actually increased the, the use of uh, per game uh, to $100 and also the use of our bigger uh, artificial fields at the annex and the high school to $1,000 to appropriately reflect you know, what the value of those are. So it's not going to be perfect. We're going to implement it, and while we're doing it now, and I'm not trying to rush, but it's much like the blight. We can, ad we can amend this if we need to. But these teams now are planning, and they've been knocking at um, Mark's door and ringing the phone off the hook to try to reserve these fields, and he's been telling them, wait, we're going to put this into effect. So what I'd like to do, it'll be a work in progress, but I think we should adopt it, um, see what revenues we generate. We're doing a sinking fund. The council wanted that. John Wilcox, the finance director, I think it's appropriate in something like this. So the people that are using the fields or are being asked to now pay for them, no, this isn't going into the general fund and going for other purposes. This is going to be put back specifically for use in recreational fields, maybe a gazebo, a basketball court somewhere, so we can have the money and use it for that specific purpose of enhancing recreational and fields. Now, what I will say, we're going to look at facilities next. That's separate. Mr. Kiner, kind of enough, made it, they had taken out, unfortunately, by mistake, um, when the town attorney was reviewing it, on the issue of nonprofits and profits using uh, facilities. So it was put back in because it wasn't our intention to delete it. The council may well want to do that later. We're talking about the Lions Clubs and Rotary using the Senior Center. That's not open for discussion. Believe me, this was complex enough to tackle this. So I would like to limit it to the fields, to this rate structure. Let's get it on the books. Um, let's start uh, having people pay an appropriate amount, amount uh, for the use of the fields, and then we're going to start looking at facilities next, and then we'll make recommendations, go to the subcommittee, and come back to you for your consideration on those. So, gentlemen, be, uh, Bill, I know you had a question. I, I'm sure you have, Gina. So, if you, anything from you, gentlemen? I know Chris gave a pretty good introduction. I don't know if you guys have anything. No, I think they're basically here to answer questions because Mark's the expert in the matter, and Donald has been helpful in getting all of the comparables from the area towns and making recommendations uh, to us that were very Silly's useful. Not, Silly's not a part of this, but. Go ahead, Bill. You have a question. You know, I'm still not certain where, where we stand with, with facilities. Um, the question that was brought up a couple of times in the, in the past was as it relates to the nonprofits such as Lions Club, Rotary, and so forth. And as I read this, it says that nonprofits with principal offices located in the town of Enfield, uh, which would include organizations such as this is fields only this is fields, fields only, only though right so well, how do we is, okay yeah. so the question i have is so where do we stand now with facilities we're looking is that at gonna be a, another meeting another yes, town as, council meeting yes as soon as we conclude this that same a working group that i have we're going to tackle facilities okay. and address all of those questions all right thank you council sakala thanks um 
So first, Chris and Kasha, thank you for answering my like 300 questions so far today. Um, the last two that I had sent, I guess my last question um, that I don't believe I had gotten an answer to is practices. So we have a rate structure for games. What we don't have is something for practices. And I, I will tell you that um, I personally know Mark works his butt off during these seasons. Um, he does a wonderful job. Um, so I guess where I'm worried is we have organizations that use these fields for practices, they, although they may not play games here. What are we doing about that? Because to be honest, a practice ruins your field more than a game does. Um, and I'm not trying to not allow, I'm not, I'm not trying to pick on a private team, but what are we going to do about practicing on these fields? If we don't have a rate structure, is there a rate structure? Will there be a charge? Because right now there's not. The I don't know if we talk about maybe a seasonal fee where if your organization is going to come on and although you may not be playing a game, you're either going to have a scrimmage or you're going to practice, do you get like a, a, a seasonal you know, uh, May through July fee. I mean, have we thought about that? Because no, this does not address no. this at all. We didn't give it. Uh, we didn't even give it a passing thought until you raised it. Um, and I'm quite shocked that Mark didn't bring this up. No, I'm kidding. Mark. <laughs> Mark <laughs> spends a lot of time. It is now on the radar. When I saw it, I said, "Wow, that's a heck of a good is question." That for the record that comment, right? There? Yeah. <laughs> but, and I think I like the seasonal approach. So Mark isn't trying. It would be as come as needed. We can discuss that with him after. Um, and I will promise you that we're going to meet again next week. We'll tackle that before facility. But I wouldn't want to hold this up because that's going to take some more grappling. So I would ask that you consider this on its merits tonight because we can add that in quickly. But I really need to get the whole find out what other towns are doing. I didn't see anything, and Mark can correct me, addressing practices per se. There is but no. And so, you know, once again, um, it's really the enforcement part. It's very difficult because he'd have to then start scheduling, which is okay. Uh, but I think we need to find out. I, I agree with your premise that they do just as much damage, maybe more, uh, yeah. to the field. So I think we want to grapple and look at that next. I thank you for raising it, um, and we will consider it. But we just didn't have time to come up with a solution over the last couple hours. And I, I guess I do have one last question. I probably shouldn't know the answer to this, and it may be in here, so I apologize. But again, it was a lot to digest since Friday, and it was very busy for me. So um, who is getting the insurance information who do they have to provide that to is that is that your Mark. department yes. all right and that would be it would sort of stay on file the entire season with you yes. so we can make sure and since I haven't seen one of these insurance documents um, does it cover like, the entire season or does it cover just games I don't know how they work I'm assuming well, it covers the, the whole organization so it's a time frame the leagues go yeah it, okay. it goes by year usually January to January um, it covers the entire year, and uh, we always have in the bottom corner the uh, town of Enfield, 820 Enfield Street, is always listed as the certificate holder. Okay. So it doesn't go like to a JFK if they play at JFK, or it doesn't go to a Fermi, it goes to the town of Enfield. Good. I, I mean, I just, I would love for our fields to be able to be used by everybody. I just don't know that we have enough fields all the time to allow even you know the Enfield teams and these private teams and out of town teams to come in and there's sort of there's there's a struggle for more than one team to get on a field especially practices and that is why I brought that up no, so thank you I'm I appreciate it and we'll look at that it. and I would just caution that I think there'll probably be you know a reaction that won't be positive by those who are now going to have to pay and you may get phone calls and they'll solicit you know your uh, sympathy. So w have patience. We'll look at it. We can always consider to add somebody if we left them off. But Mark really knows who the players are uh, that are really legitimate local town teams, and that's who we've exempted. All others will now have to pay, and I imagine that there will be some period of adjustment. So just send them, uh, let them call Mark, <laughs> and he'll handle the inquiries. And if we need to adjust the policy, we'll come back to you. Right. So thank like, you I'm for not, your... I'm not trying to gouge anybody. I'm just, no. I want to make sure that we, if we're going to enact a policy, that we yeah. make it encompassing and it makes sense. Yeah, you guys good. Jeannie, you all set? Okay. Councilman Bosco, Deputy Mayor Suzak, Councilor Grisaya, then Councilor Denny. Yeah, well, we looked at this at the uh, DPW subcommittee, and uh, 
Now, Gina, that's that the practice is a good a good thing. But again, just like everything, you know, as long as we have it on our radar, uh, we can get it. It seemed like it was pretty important, um, especially the way they called the meeting, to get it done as soon as possible so uh, they can start renting out the fields. And um, this really is just going to be there so we can fix the fields or maybe even give the fields a break because uh, the grass gets so beat up from everyone using it that uh, you know we'll be putting some money away now to be able to repair the fields you know you just never know you can fix some basketball courts with this money you can uh, put a gazebo in like we were talking down at the, at the park and rent the park out so with this document this should open us up for even more stuff that we could do in the town as you know someone may just want a field that's uh have a baseball party for their kids and bring out their family and and rent it so uh i guess it was pretty important to get this thing passed and uh as long as we have the the bugs that we know already to look at we could take care of them pretty quick and and get them figured out thank you deputy mayor suzak I guess I have a quick question, and this is maybe to Mark. Mark, do they actually schedule practices? No, I don't. I don't. I don't schedule. What what uh, what we get is we get um, schedules from from all the leagues, and they say these are our game days. Once that happens, buildings and grounds rides the fields, um, all the fields each day. If we don't see any games on that field, we don't line it, but we still ride it, and then uh, individual leagues. Uh, schedule their own practices so okay so I guess for me you know I sat sit on DPW we had a long meeting of it we all came to it I actually would like to see them pay to do that so perhaps it, they need to schedule practices and it should be scheduled usage of fields I, I think for me that's what what I want to see happen because you know just because you didn't schedule a game, it isn't a free-for-all. Anybody uses the fields for whatever they want to do. So somehow you guys are better at this than I am. So, But for me, you know, practices should be scheduled usage, and it should be scheduled usage whether it be games or practices. Councilor Grisotti. Now, going along with uh, the, the practices, uh, I, I think the majority of the uh, the leagues in terms of their games and their practices I, I think you're you're pretty much notified of all of that they were talking about these other teams these outside teams that want to come in well if we're going to be charging of game wise if they want to come and use the field I'm, I'm for that you know they should be paying on a daily basis if they're going to be practicing and it just, it's part of a rental whether it's a game or a practice it's the same fee so that could be a quick little insert uh, in regard to that. All right, I, I, I don't see that, that being an issue. If somebody's using the field and they're not one of these organizations, they have to be, if they're gonna be charged for their games, charge them for practice also. Um, the other thing that I just wanna see in here as being uh, an exempt fee, because over the years you, you've, you've done a fantastic job with the uh, allied sports rehabilitation programs uh, to, for the special olympics program here in town to be on this list also okay i didn't you know i, I should have mentioned that so before so we keep but. is that all right if we had that as an amendment well we can but i i mean i i just what we could just say is because clearly everybody's exempted that are our local right. team so this is going to apply to the same group can't come up with what a seasonal would be but you could say just make an amendment that it will be 100 dollars per game or per practice no but no Mark, it's not about i'm talking about allied, allied? not about the practice oh, oh, yeah I'm not, allied. not talking about i'm talking about allied being on, on this list not, not about the practice no. i'd have to defer to mark i was consulting with yeah. the attorney about an amendment so I didn't hear the question. Yeah. I mean, we've never had an issue in the past. So. Absolutely not. Yeah. We, could, we could discuss and, and that. Plus, I want, I, I want to commend the both of you, along with Rich Prosciutti, and uh, the upkeep of the JFK pool throughout this particular season for our, for our program. We've got a couple, we have a coach also in the, in the grounds here in the uh, audience, Mr. Margolfo who's actively involved with this and uh, <clears throat> we appreciate all of your hard work in regard to keeping that pool up every week that we're in that pool. It's 
perfect at water temperature is awesome so thank you Councilor Danny all right two I got two things one I think Donna you're a little mis misconception anyone that's listed on this exempt list can practice yeah, right. I know that. Part right. of, okay, right. well, no. that's not how it came out. No, it's Gina is talking about outside people using it for right. practice. Right, and that's right. what I'm trying to get okay. is that okay. if you're outside and you're paying for a game, you're also going to pay, pay for practice. practice. Uh, yeah. Good, okay, I thought it was inside. Yeah. Now, the other, the real question is this. This weekend, we had this meeting on, what, Thursday, Public Works? Yeah. This weekend, there are people that can't use your fields because they're muddy, but they're on the synthetic turfs. Now, <laughs> I, know, I know you're not the police department, and neither is Donald or I, but are we going to, once we pass this thing, are we going to be shagging them off those fields? Well, this is something that we spoke about. That that's, I, I guess we've been that's discussed, my that's question. A, it's I don't a separate know we, issue. We totally talked about that at Public right. Works. Um, and it is an issue, again, of who's available and, and when. We're going to be putting on the, on the major, on the annex and the high school, permit use only, first come, first serve to Enfield residents only, and then anybody else who's there that shouldn't be is going to be asked. And we'll have to have a discussion with the police department in regard to that. But you have to have the proper signage. And, you know, let, softball players on the, on the so on did the, Mr. Crisati, um, did you want to make an amendment to add the allied? Yeah. Before um, before we get there, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that, yeah. That's what that's what he was asking, not about practice. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry before. No, I'm good. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Sakala. So does allied not fall under either EGSA or ELL? No. They don't. I know the challengers do. The Challenger Baseball Challenger. does, but, yeah, our, but Allied our, doesn't. Our Special Olympic program okay. does not fall it's on under his own. any of those. It's on right. its own. So that should definitely be the go back on there. But I will say, I guess, I know we're not discussing practices, but we are. I will say, though, if, if we're going to charge for practices, I would personally be in favor of a seasonal fee and not a per practice per game because to be honest that is a lot of money that right. you are going to start charging people for $100 a game, $25 a practice, whatever it is. If you do a, a fee instead for a season, I think that's much more reasonable because even if they're not town teams, they're still not major for profit teams. Right. And I mean, I don't I don't I'm sure what's going on on the turf fields may be like an entire league, but I don't know. That would just be my opinion. Thank you. Councilor Sparaza. I agree with Donna and Bob that they should pay for practices, but just looking at this, it seems that 98% of the exempted are our little leagues. They're all set. So when we talk about out-of-town teams, Aren't we talking about tournaments, people, commercial enterprises where they have tournaments for the day and they charge these teams 200, you know, they make money on this deal, right? Yeah, that's that's the tournament fees that are listed a little bit right. uh, below. So they don't typically practice, right? They just come for the day and do the just tournament. To Correct. But but we do have out-of-town leagues that come in um, that, that play. We have some... Uh, uh, over 30 baseball leagues that come in. We have uh, uh, some private teams that come in that... Uh, a coach might live in Enfield and and take a, a, a private team that's not with the Little League or, or whatnot, and, and uh, they come and use our fields. They play different towns and whatnot. There are what we say, what I call private teams um, that aren't under any of these under these listings, okay. and and they use they use our fields. Okay. Like an entire league on the artificial turf that might be flag football from another town. Yeah, what, what's up with that? That's, that's I think that's right. the major issue. What's yeah. up with that is that's where we're passing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. any, any other questions? No, I just want to say I agree with Councilor Sakala. It should be a seasonal fee on prior. I agree. It's yeah, I, I mean I I agree. well look because I, I hate to act quickly and make a mistake can. because as you say Mark will know the frequency. We got to think about enforcement. Right. Seasonal will be easier from a you know it'll be a so, nightmare to start so, scheduling so two practices. Two things quick before we get um, my only my only ask is can we put. Your, if Mark's the con, can we put it on the, the front of the website, under maybe under yours? I can't tell how many people call me not knowing who to call. And so can we make it easier so if someone's looking at the Mark is the, if Mark's the contact, can he, 
Can it be on the front page under your site or something? Sure. Uh, I mean, know, I know I get questions almost once a week. Okay. Hey, who's the person? All right. Yeah. I think the people who traditionally use it, most of them know, right. but probably a new team. So right. we can post it wherever we're going to put this and on the manager's website as well. We'll list Mark as the contact person. So any other questions? The amendment, Bob, you want to make an amendment to add um, to page schedule, schedule A. A. Of the, I'm going to make sure, and I'll bow, defer to you. Of the athletic organizations exempt from rental fees listed above, Bob, the organization. The Allied uh, Special Olympics program. So we have a motion by Bob, Allied Special Olympics. Uh, let me make sure we write this down. Olympics program. Second by Councillor Muller. Any discussion on the amendment? Hearing none by a show of hands, all those in favor of the amendment? Opposed? We have 11 in favor, zero against of the amendment. Any more questions on the motion as amended? No, we're going to have to put the other amendment to include practice. No, no, no. That's not, that's not now. That's a whole different discussion. Practices are because she needs to come up with a seasonal fee. Right, right. Chris just said that. That's why we're waiting. We're, we're getting this passed, and then the, this will be come back. Right. Right. We're going to amend it again. We're going to amend it. I, I guess for me, I don't. I want to make it really clear that there no, that it isn't just games. I mean, you've really brought up a valid point, and I would like yeah, to say right. games at, or practices, and then we can amend it later if we do a seasonal. I don't want anybody thinking that they're going to pay for a game, and then they're going to come and practice but three it, times a week. But I think if we make I agree, it, but there's no way we can put practices in here at a hundred dollars. That is insane. People will be paying a thousand dollars before the season even started. Yeah, I agree. Can't do it. I understand your point, but I think if we do Which that. Which I, I agree right. with your yeah. point. But it, to be, nobody's allowed on the field probably for another month anyway. So if this is something that we can get done within the next two weeks by the next meeting, I'm assuming that we can at least have that part amended. Yep. And well, I would we, love to we, be involved in the rate structure. You no, know, I don't if we want Mark to get caught and, you know, and make it as easy for him as possible. And, you know, we've got. Donald's taking yep. short. Yeah. yeah, he can fair warn them. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Read as amended, the main motion. Roll call, please. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Four. Councilor Ungire. Four. Councilor Bosco. Four. Councilor Sakala. Four. Councilor Casati. Four. Councilor Davis. Four. Councilor Denny. Four. Councilor Kiner. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Muller. Four. Councilor Saraza. Four. There's 11 in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Uh, item, thank you. Item 16, public communications. Would anyone like to speak? Good job, gentlemen. Anyone like to speak for the thank council at this time? Thank you. <laughs> at this time. John. Welcome. Hey, uh, gonna keep it quick. Uh, I was looking up uh, JCW or JC address, John. Oh, 12 Homelock Drive. Thanks. I was looking up JCJ, right? It is JCJ. JCJ. Yeah. And, uh, I was online looking at some of their projects just now, and I'm pretty impressed with some of the stuff that they've done in the past. So I think uh, they'll do a pretty good job updating JFK, and that's that's a pretty good choice. So I yeah, just want to end on a good note. Thank you, sir. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you, John. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for the council at this time? Hearing none, I declare public communication is closed. Item 17, any council communications at this time? Hearing none, item 18, a motion to adjourn. Motion. Right, Deputy Mayor, by Councilor uh, Saraza, se seconded by Councilor Ungar. All those in favor by a show of hands. Opposed, 11 in favor, zero against. Now I know we're at scale eight, but let's move right into the next section of the meeting. So, um, Thank you, folks. This is, again, Monday, March 18th. The regular council meeting has adjourned. We are now moving on to the Water Pollution Control Authority special meeting of March 18th, 2019. Roll call, please. Councilor Bo or Commissioner Bosco. Here. Commissioner Sakala. Here. Commissioner Casati. Here. Commissioner Davis. Here. Commissioner Denny. Here. Commissioner Kiner. Here. Chairman Ludwig. Here. Commissioner Muller. Here. Commissioner Spraza. Here. Vice Chairman Suzak. Here. Commissioner Ungeyer. Here. There's 11 commissioners present. Uh, do I have a motion to approve item number two, special meeting January 22nd of 2019? So moved. 
by Deputy second. Mayor, by Commissioner uh, Suzak, seconded by Commissioner uh, Crisati. Any omissions, deletions, corrections? Hearing none by a show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed? We have 11 in favor, zero against. Item three, we don't have any old business. Item four, we have no new business. Item five, items for discussion. Item A, discussion resolution, waiver the external grease and scepter, interceptor requirement for Joy Ball. Okay. Um, where is, and I, I oh, man, I'm gonna ruin the name already. Um, any idea on Rui? Rui Zhao doing business as Joy Bowl Poke LLC has filed an application for site plan review with the Planning and Zoning Commission, SBR 1761, to locate a restaurant called Joy Bowl at 54 Hazard Avenue. Whereas, I'm sorry, Ruiz Zawi doing business as Joy Bowl, Bowl Polk LLC requested a waiver for the requirements of the external grease trap and will comply with the requirements of the town code 136B using an interior grease interceptor and whereas the offices of the Director of Public Works has reviewed the requested waiver and found it in compliance with the conditions as follows. Item one, waiver is valid for only Joy Bowl, Bowl Polk LLC at 54 Hazard Ave and it is non-transferable. Two, any change in use, menu, or ownership shall be submitted to the Office of Director of Public Works and North Central Health District for the compliance of the waiver. Three, Joy Bowl Polk LLC shall remain in full compliance with the requirements of the North Central Health District for a written, a current written agreement for the minimum minimum cleaning and maintenance of the grease interceptor shall be maintained on file with the Office of the Director of Public Works and the North Central Health District. Five, failure to maintain in compliance with these conditions shall automatically cause a waiver to be rescinded. Therefore, be resolved. The Enfield Water Pollution Control Authority does hereby approve a waiver by Joy, Joy Bowl Polk LLC for the use of an interior grease interceptor in lieu of an exterior grease trap with the conditions as listed. Do I have a motion to approve? By second. Commissioner Bosco, seconded by Commissioner Crisati. Where is, I got a question. So, I'll, you want to vote down real brief, but and then we'll. It's in Stop Shop Plaza. Is it in the external outside the building? The origin, <clears throat> our original specifications call for the being an external grease trap, which means all that stuff's going to be located outside in the parking lot and outside of the building. They want, they asked us for an internal instead. It's quicker, it's easier for them, and it's, it's just a, a break for them. Stop and shop plot. Any other commissioners or questions? I don't know if anything you want to add. Nope. No. <laughs> we, they've been in, oh, like, they've been in constant contact with Kevin Schlatz and I, and so we we're we're, we're all we're we're okay right. with it. We just need your authority to do it. Commissioner Suzak. Now they've received permission through the P and Z on this. Did they go to P and Z? I have to go to P and Z for this. I don't. I don't know that answer. Okay. I, can have, I, I can. didn't know if we were the first stop or the second stop. No. Thanks. <laughs> Roll call, please. Commissioner Bosco. Four. Commissioner Sakala. Four. Commissioner Crisati. Four. Commissioner Davis. Four. Commissioner Denny. Four. Commissioner Kiner. Four. Chairman Ludwig. Four. Commissioner Muller. Four. Commissioner Sparaza. Four. Vice Chairman Suzak. Four. Commissioner Ungeyer. Four. There's 11 in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Item B, under items for discussion, resolution to abate sewer fees on 19 Maple Avenue, resolved that the Enfield Water Pollution Control Authority, pers pursuant to the Connecticut General Statute 12-124, hereby abates 1,216 of the sewer use fees due to the, due to the October 23, 2018 meter reading for the property located at 19 Maple Ave, owned by Jeff Jeffrey Alexander, submitted on March 11, 2019, by the Director of Finance. By Councillor Muller, seconded by Councillor Bosco. John, if you want to just real brief, I know we, because I know you're, you, you know, give you a chance to, this is, this is a unique, unique situation. Yeah. We question this. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. Yep. So I don't know, if, real brief, why, you know, what happened? Um, <clears throat> this uh, property, uh, the, the renter of this property um, um, broke part of the uh, part of the uh, the uh, water system or, or toilet actually, and caused um, <clears throat> massive leaks of of uh, water. And, and we were just trying to help the the um, the owner of the property 
um, not having to absorb the cost of the of the sewer fee for that. I'll just add just so that you know it's a special circumstance. There's uh, a privacy issue of the tenant um, who has unique needs. Uh, the home, the owner of the property did all that he could to discover it. The police actually were called, so it was verified that this was a situation where he was blameless. He replaced the toilet as soon as he found out. He did all that he could, and John uh, appropriately brought it uh, forward for the abatement. Although John's pretty tough and doesn't abate much or recommend it, he felt that this is a real uh, it, one that merits it, and it really would impact poorly the tenant that perhaps would be asked to leave, who does have special circumstances. So we didn't want to embarrass anybody but the fact that John uh, is recommending it that meant a lot to me I think as well to the governance committee and I would urge that you without too many more questions approve it so councilors I don't want to speak for Council Sakala or Councilor Muller myself but Chris is spot on with John we did hear it for our committee I have no and question. okay yeah I got one so bill one second Councilor Bosco then Councilor Kiner uh, when when we uh, did this ordinance in the beginning I thought we left an avenue for you guys to take care of this stuff and but it didn't have to come to us and not, I don't but it specifically excludes leaks so that somebody has leaky toilets or didn't replace equipment uh, it doesn't give us the authority to do it therefore because of the extra extraordinary amount of water that was used here um, we had we felt it was appropriate given the amount of money over eleven $1 hundred dollars to ask the council's input because yeah, when, when, when we did it I figured if you had Most, a yeah. leak and and you had a plumber and it was a bona fide wow. leak that you know we would figure out an average that someone used instead of coming I think if we did that we would have more uh, people coming out of the woodwork um, than you'd want to you know hear about so no that that specifically when they passed it was not a reason to come forward for debate okay so councillor kiner any questions or commissioner kiner excuse me no um under whose name is this utility under is it under um jeffrey alexander or is it under the person whose apartment is affected by this water problem typically who's paying it, the utility bill the utility bills are paid usually it's in a rental contract most of them are paid to the landlord by the tenant um, but in the, the water is actually billed to the landlord so it's the landlord's it's responsibility to, to pay this bill yes it is is there any precedent for this I mean you know I'm kind of new on the council and this is I, I really don't understand how this works if someone has a leak in their in their facility, in their house, that they're renting out. Can this person say, hey, I didn't know the water was running f for three months, four months, Once and I again, want the town to pay for it? No. <clears throat> well, they, they could. Um, they could. Which one, again, that's a, a rec. They can supply a, they can submit a requisite a request to the General Government and Finance Committee which we have designated as the um, <clears throat> standing abatement committee for the town. I wouldn't recommend it in, you know, like I said, this is a unique situation. You know, you know, Bill, <clears throat> we've at, we, we generally actually reject most abatements. So that's why they never come before you here. Okay. That's why they're rare. So we, we actually reject them into John's point in the subcommittee because it, this, it's a unique situation and, and I'll say, you know, John, I don't want to speak for John, but the landlord did the right thing in this, in our opinion. I'll say in our opinion. And so I think that's why this is before the Water Pollution Control Authority. That's why they're rare. That's why you're not going to see them every meeting, to John's point, because they come before us, and then we debate whether that you, we bring it back to each caucus if they think it's valuable, and then it comes to the, the Water Pollution Control or the town council. So just, just one last question, just uh, your thoughts on this. Are we setting any kind of precedent? By doing this? No. I, no. I don't believe we are. It's so, a case by case basis. You have so, discretion. So it's, like so it's interesting, right? So the council actually, we have to do this in public. And we had a few, I think, what, last year? I think we had a couple, and it wasn't unanimous vote. Yeah, so before it even gets here, we vet it in the general governance. And if we're against it, we basically don't bring it to the council. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yep. Deputy Mayor Suzak. I guess, Bill, for you, I'd like to clarify that your sewer usage is a, is like your, the tax bill that you receive for property, that the owner of the property is responsible 
for your tax bill and for the sewer usage bill. So we really, there isn't an avenue to actually the tenants to be responsible for this. This is a utility that the owner of the property is responsible for, just like the tax bill. Does that help? Any further discussion? Hearing on roll call, please. Commissioner Bosco. Uh, four. Commissioner Sakala. Four. Commissioner Crisati. Four. Commissioner Davis. Four. Commissioner Denny. Four. Commissioner Kiner. No. Chairman Ludwig. Four. Commissioner Muller. Four. Commissioner Spraza. Four. Vice Chairman Suzak. Four. Commissioner Ungeyer. Four. There's ten in favor, one against, and no extensions. We have no items for miscellaneous. Motion, item seven, motion to adjourn so, motion. by Councilor Muller, Commissioner Muller, seconded by Commissioner Denny. All those in favor by a show of hands. Opposed, 11 in favor, zero against. Good night, everyone. Thank you.